Spiders. Spiders everywhere. Covering every inch of the containment site. Entombing, screaming researchers in webs and crawling all over them. How did this happen? Let's rewind. We regret to inform you the break room is closed today. There is currently a spider loose in the facility. Researcher Yuri craned his neck to look past the line of personnel that had gathered in the hallway. Reading the sign hastily scrawled on a piece of paper from the photocopier. Behind him, he overheard a fellow researcher, Holland, complaining about the way to get to the break room. Not in the least part pleased about the idea of spending his precious half-hour lunch break standing around in a corridor, while someone presumably stood on a table with a can of onslaught insecticide. When Yuri instinctively corrected him that spiders were arachnids, not insects, Holland shot him a venomous glare, indicating that he already knew that. As he turned away from the awkward encounter, he noticed researcher Andrews next to him, who wasn't grumbling away to his co-workers or impatiently checking his watch like everyone else. He was staring at the ceiling. Yuri started looking up in the same direction, following Andrew's gaze until he noticed what had him so transfixed. Above the heads of the gaggle of personnel waiting to access the break room was a mass of cobwebs. Ordinarily, there would be no cause for concern. After all, even the Foundation's facilities needed regular cleaning and upkeep. But what was odd about this web was, at first glance, it looked like there was a piece of equipment trapped in it. Some kind of machine component. It was only when Yuri squinted and leaned forward to see closer that he noticed the component wasn't in the web. It was made of the web. The very same thin, wispy thread that had been wound in such a way that it was forming part of something. As for exactly what, it was hard to say. But it immediately had Yuri thinking a particularly unnerving thought. A spider was loose in the facility. The sign did not specify what kind of spider. And the odd web above seemed to indicate that it might well have been of the anomalous variety. Leaving the complaining personnel to stand around wasting their breaks, Yuri ducked down an adjacent hallway and started scrolling through the contacts on his phone. He read a file on an anomaly that caused ordinary everyday objects to suddenly transform into angry spiders, and a close respected colleague of his, Agent McGuire, worked closely with the mobile task force responsible for containing these agitated arachnids. Hearing McGuire answer the phone, Yuri immediately asked him about the current state of SCP-3023. McGuire very passively told him that everything was normal, and that no new instances had been reported in the region. SCP-3023 seemed to only affect a very specific area of central Germany, right in the middle of Hanover, Leipzig, and Kassel. Then, Yuri asked if it was possible for an inanimate object to suddenly turn into an angry spider anywhere outside of that area. For example, in the break room. Immediately, his brain conjured up the image of the billiards table with eight spindly spider legs erupting out from beneath its green surface, angrily crawling all around the room, waiting for the break room door to open and all the impatient personnel to come flooding in. McGuire told him what SCP-3023 instances did to any living thing they came into contact with, and it sure wasn't pretty. From the other side of the line, Agent McGuire reassured researcher Yuri that there had never been any reported instances involving SCP-3023 outside of Germany. When Yuri followed that up with the question of whether or not there were any currently in containment, the MTF Alpha-21 operative replied that all instances were normally destroyed on contact. The answers put the panicked researcher at ease, long enough for him to calmly apologize to his friend and thank him for his time before hanging up the phone. That was when the lights went out. An alarm started to sound, bellowing from deep in the heart of the facility and reaching outwards, like the strands of a web. The sound denoted one horrible thing. There had been a containment breach. As the blood-red emergency lighting blinked on, Yuri rushed back the way he'd come, expecting to see the same huddle of personnel near the break room, expecting one of them might know exactly which SCP had made it out of containment. The sight waiting for him was far worse. As he approached the hallway, he heard the overlapping screams of his colleagues. Researcher Andrew came dashing around the corner, his wiry frame sending him barreling past Yuri before he could even ask what was going on. Then, from around the corner, Researcher Holland could be seen clawing his way along the floor, yelling for someone to help him. There were spiders all over him.
Thousands of them. The sheer number of them crawling over his body made them look almost like a formless mass that was slowly pulling him back down the corridor towards the break room. Yuri dashed forwards, intending to grab Holland's hand and pull him to safety. But before he could get close enough, the other researcher had been taken by the spiders. That was when Yuri turned the corner and saw the full extent of the containment breach. Spiders everywhere. Crawling all over the floor, spiders. Climbing up the walls, spiders. Dangling from the ceiling by threads, spiders. A number of lumps on the ground were writhing and thrashing, but so covered in spiders that it took Yuri a second to realize who was underneath. The other personnel, each of them trying to brush away the spiders that were coating their bodies and dragging them off to who knows where. Under the blinking red of the emergency light, the spiders made the hallway look like it was alive, and illuminated what was crawling at the far side, directly opposite Yuri. The giant spider was looking right at him, each one of its numerous dark eyes looking practically demonic under the red light. It was enormous, easily at least nine feet tall, big enough to almost fill the corridor. Keeping his eyes fixed on it out of fear, Yuri felt a slow, shaking step backwards, trying to move his legs behind him as gently as possible. If he turned to run, he'd startle the horrifying creature and probably bring it racing after him on its multiple legs. Before he could get away, he would be dragged away with the others, or worse. From the other side of the corridor, the spider's front pinchers bristled as Yuri shifted his weight onto his back foot. He hated looking at the monstrous arachnid, but forced himself to keep his eyes front, looking right at it as it looked back at him. Rear foot planted, he began to lift his other one, only to see the spider's front two legs extend outwards. It was reaching towards him, through the writhing mass of smaller spiders that coated the walls and floor between them. Yuri's single ice-cold bead of sweat ran down the back of his neck, under the collar of his shirt, and crawled down his back. It was impossible not to imagine it was one of the spiders. The two giant legs became four as the spider seemed to extend from its space it occupied at the other side of the corridor. Was it just stretching, repositioning, or getting ready to dash forward? Every second of uncertainty made researcher Yuri all the more terrified, noticing out of the corner of his eyes the mass of smaller spiders inching closer to him. It was like the giant was the general of an entire eight-legged horde that was making a skittering advance towards their target. The side of the hallway Yuri found himself frozen in was a corner, turning down in only one direction, only one way he could run, and one path that the spiders could follow him down. It was either move now, or wait for the spiders to move first and faster. He turned heel and ran, the soles of his shoes squeaking against the floor. Behind him came the rapid thudding of eight heavy legs hurriedly scuttling through the corridor after him. The sound began lower, on the floor then sideways, scaling up the wall until it was above, drumming along the ceiling as Yuri forced himself not to look over his shoulder. He already knew what he would see, and the thought of it horrified him. The huge spider chasing after him from above, pinchers reared as it readied itself to lunge the moment it was close enough to catch him. Hours later, two agents, Jetter and Moore, were part of the cleanup crew tasked with sweeping each floor of the facility. Orange tongues of flame spat from their incinerators, clearing masses of spiders until there was no trace. Even without the hundreds of thousands of spiders crawling all over it, the facility was in dire need of repair, with chunks missing from the walls and damage all over the place. So much metal and plastic was missing, it was almost like it had just been ripped from every conceivable place, but with no debris strewn everywhere. Part of the building had just vanished. Maybe these spiders just ate all the metal and plastic they found, Moore joked. Flamethrowers at the ready, they managed to push the spiders back to their nest, expecting to find a room covered in cobwebs, possibly even with some lifeless humanoid shapes entangled in a big web. What they weren't expecting to come across was a room full of 3D printers. But then again, that was to be expected when it came to SCP-4663, otherwise known as SCP-4663. 3D printed spiders, printing printed printers, printing spider printers, printing spiders, printing printed spider printers, printing printing spider printers, printing spiders, printing printed printer spiders, printing spidered spider printers, printing spider spider printed printer printers. Long tongue tying names aside, SCP-4663 had long been examined by the researchers of the SCP Foundation. 
The designation itself was given to an anomalous species of spiders that had been discovered to be indigenous to areas of Europe and certain regions within North and South America. Far from being potentially venomous or capable of transforming seemingly inanimate everyday objects into more spiders, this particular species instead displayed a natural aptitude for, well, three-dimensional filament printing. These SCP-4663 spiders are capable of consuming anything in their path, as long as it is inorganic matter, meaning unlike non-anomalous species of spider, they don't actually feed on insects or even mammals. Instead, instances of SCP-4663 usually subsist on a diet of primarily metal and plastic. However, they don't appear to consume these for any kind of nutritional value. Through some anomalous process in their physiology, these spiders are able to convert the raw materials they consume into their threads, and rather than creating nests or webs with which to catch their prey, they utilize this byproduct to make 3D printers. Yes, you heard us right. SCP-4663 spiders use their web to make the housing and internal components of functioning 3D printers. Oh, and these printers are also alive. Referred to as SCP-4663-1, the printers created by these anomalous arachnids are separate living entities. In every physical detail, they resemble 3D printers, however do not match any of those that are commercially available for purchase. In terms of their functionality though, SCP-4663-1 instances do perform the same purpose as standard non-anomalous printers, and can be operated identically to traditional printers, although without the need for an STL file. However, a number of SCP-4663-1's components are known to betray them as living organisms. For example, the display screen present on each instance, which is known to be the anomalous printer's eyes. The power cord of each one functions as a tail and can be plugged into an electrical outlet. Doing so increases the efficiency of the printer by 3000%. The extruder of an SCP-4663-1 functions as intestines for processing and then removing material, as well as providing the printers with a crude method of transport. The component that is responsible for spooling the filament is replaced by an organ much like a stomach, and can store significantly more material than SCP-4663-1 outwardly appears to be able to contain. Additionally, the printer's electrical input and output ports function as mouths. Oh yes, these printers need to be fed in order to work. Normally, it takes a colony of around 25 to 50,000 SCP-4663 instances to create one of these SCP-4663-1 printers. Once the spiders have constructed one of the printers, their next course of action will be to feed the newly constructed SCP-4663-1 instance. This will involve the spiders seeking out any nearby organic material and then depositing it in the mouths of an SCP-4663-1 instance. This can include plant life as well as other living organisms, which are digested and used to create the filament in order for an SCP-4663-1 instance to print. And what exactly do these anomalous printers print? More spiders, of course. This is how SCP-4663 is able to reproduce. As long as a continuous supply of biological matter is fed into an SCP-4663-1, the printer will continue creating new spiders at a rate of one every two and a half minutes. These newly printed spiders will set about eating inorganic matter and creating a new 3D printer, which in turn will print out more spiders, leading the cycle to repeat itself. When presented with an otherwise ordinary 3D printer, the SCP-4663 spiders are also able to convert these standard non-anomalous devices into additional instances of SCP-4663-1. For a time, the SCP Foundation wasn't concerned about the behavior of these 3D printed spiders printing spider printers. Keeping them housed in Type II containment terrariums, the researchers working on site had even seemingly found a practical application for SCP-4663, waste disposal. The spider colonies were being thrown trash from Foundation facilities, which the spiders would mostly consume, thus reducing the amount of garbage produced on site. However, despite being an unintentional mishap, this led to an incident on the 27th of June, 2018. Given the sheer amount of waste they'd been fed and thus used to make the thread to build 3D printers, one of the SCP-4663 colonies in Foundation containment had reached a population count of over 1 million spiders. 
Upon reaching this number, the anomalous spiders became frenzied and began pushing their numerous 3D printers toward each other. Once these SCP-4663-1s were close enough to each other, the spider colony began consuming their containment unit itself for raw materials. The printers were then able to create a much larger instance of SCP-4663, dubbed SCP-4663-2. This giant arachnid was over 9 feet in height and, upon its creation, promptly began to attempt an escape from Foundation containment. SCP-4663-2 seemingly acted as some form of leader for other instances of the anomalous spiders, or possibly even some kind of queen, given its ability to create a thousand SCP-4663s in a single second. These newly created versions of the spiders were around six times larger than the average SCP-4663 instances, many of which were composed of varying combinations of inorganic and organic matter. This was owing to the fact that while traversing the Foundation facility housing it, SCP-4663-2 was also able to use any surrounding material it came into contact with in order to create these other spiders, as well as fashioning itself additional legs and more new SCP-4663-1 3D printers as well. Eventually, the larger SCP-4663-2 spider was captured. It had seemed to be heading towards a separate SCP-4663 colony in an apparent attempt to merge with them and add those spiders to its army. Following this breach, none of the SCP-4663 colonies that the Foundation keeps in containment are allowed to have a population bigger than 500,000. The spider writhed around in pain, trying desperately to free itself from the silk threads that were pinning its eight legs down. Agony coursed through its limbs as the venom slowly made its way towards its abdomen. All around it, a number of spiders chattered their pinchers angrily and jabbed and poked at its dying body. The spider wasn't sure how much more pain it could endure before its body would give out. It had done wrong. It knew it had. The spider had fallen short of the manifesto, of the party guidelines, and of the ideals of the fearless leader. It had communicated with the outside world without permission, so it would be tortured, and it would die. The spider just hoped that its death would come sooner rather than later, as the venom burned at each of its limbs. Then, all of a sudden, the crowd of spiders around it parted, and the whole web itself began to shake with heavy footsteps. A colossal spider with gray markings across its back towered over the others as it stalked along the web towards the dying spider. The spider closed its eyes as its fearless leader spread its mandibles wide and lunged forward. And from a couple feet above, with tears in his eyes, researcher Simon Parker scribbled furious notes into his notepad. He was sitting alone in the forest, surrounded by spider webs, with thousands of tiny spiders and eight times as many legs crawling up, down, in, and out of every tree, web, and clump of moss in the clearing. It had taken him months to build up this level of trust with the arachnids. For the longest time, none of them had trusted him. In fact, many of them had wanted him dead. There had been numerous assassination attempts as he had conducted his research, but fortunately for him, most of the spiders in the colony were not particularly venomous to humans. That was, until recently. Professor Parker had a mole on the inside. Well, not a mole, but a spider. You get the idea. He had built up a relationship with the spider, as it seemed disenfranchised by the ideals of those around it. The spider had informed him just earlier that day that the arachnids in the colony had made a deadly breakthrough in their KGB equivalent unit, a toxin so powerful it could kill the man in one bite. This was all very fascinating for Professor Parker, who watched as his informant was tortured and eaten right in front of him. It was only once he wrote the closing line in his notepad that he stopped and wondered, Exactly where was this hyper-venomous spider? He looked up just in time. A spider with terribly long legs and shiny purple markings on his back swung towards him, fangs spitting with venom. He ducked, but the spider caught in his hair and got tangled. Professor Parker leaped to his feet and sprinted out of the clearing, putting his knees through a number of newly made spider webs as he went. He ran his hands through his hair, flicking and shaking in the hopes that the spider had fallen loose. He wasn't proud to be screaming like a girl all the way out of the clearing. A couple of his colleagues poked their heads out of the nearby research lab as he approached. Embarrassment got the better of him as he slowed to a walk 
and gave them a courteous wave. He couldn't feel the spider anywhere on his head anymore. He must have gotten away with it. That was a close one. Professor Parker went to wipe the sweat away from his brow, but as he raised his hand, he saw a tiny black spider clinging onto it. He had time to let out one pathetic squeak of surprise before the arachnid plunged its fangs into his skin and killed him on the spot. SCP-1006 refers to a spider colony located in an undisclosed national park in the United States of America. The spiders within this colony vary in species and size, but are united by one shared goal – to promote and uphold the values of Marxism. This colony was discovered by a group of hikers traveling through the national park on summer break, stopping by a stream to fill up their canteens. One of the hikers noticed a rather complex and extensive network of webs hanging between some trees. The closer the hiker looked, however, the more that they realized that this was not a normal spider colony. There were species of spiders here that one would never normally see roaming free in the US. What was more, there seemed to be something like writing hanging on the webs. But surely that couldn't be. The hiker leaned in close and tried their best to read what was being said. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. Fortunately, the hiker and all of their friends thought that the writing in the web was some kind of prank being played by the National Park. They may be even a very early Halloween display. Within a week, the SCP Foundation had arrived and cordoned off the area, immediately surrounding the webbing under the guise of conservation work. Investigations began right away into the exact nature and origins of this communist group of spiders, and the results were fascinating. Not only were their writings resembling Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, but there were also a number of webs that had been spun to resemble the faces of various park rangers who would have been patrolling the area. Closer inspection revealed the existence of a number of rudimentary tools, such as twigs with pebbles tied to the tips using silk webbing. Fallen branches surrounding the central web, many of which seemed to show the markings of tiny axe cuts where they had been split from the tree. Several weeks of close observation confirmed that the spiders were indeed creating tiny axes to cut down branches under the guise of protecting the central web. This was the first evidence of the spiders' hostility towards the human race. Not only did the spiders write about the virtues of communism, but they also seemed intent on putting it into practice. SCP-1006 is one of only five remaining Marxist-Leninist states in the world, along with China, Cuba, Laos, and Vietnam. Although admittedly, the spider's version of communism is very primitive. Individual spiders have different roles within the community, each with the intention of serving the group as a whole. Some have the responsibility of maintaining and fixing any holes within the web, whilst others are given the responsibility of expanding into new territory. Some spiders catch flies, other spiders wrap them and prepare them for consumption, and most interestingly, another group separates the flies' bodies into individual meal portions and allocates an equal amount of food to every spider within the community. Beyond that, the spiders admittedly do very little. They are spiders, after all. One bright researcher by the name of Simon Parker had the idea one day to hand the spiders a piece of paper and a small pen like the kind you find in a bank at the tip of a little chain. Immediately, the spiders gathered around the pen and did their best to coordinate lifting it and dragging it around the paper. Simon Parker leaned in, excited to have his first communication with another species, but it quickly became apparent that the spiders were less than excited to talk to him. Bourgeoisie pig, charming. Day after day, Simon Parker would sit with the spiders and do his best to understand what exactly it was they wanted. He wasn't sure whether they were incredibly idealistic or simply had a completely false idea of how powerful he was. What would you like to do today? He would ask them. Dismantle Western imperialism with immediate effect before redistributing wealth equally to the masses. Right, I can't do much to help with that. It was difficult to have a conversation with them. They were hyper fixated on their goal and had little time to talk about niceties or more pertinent topics like where they had come from. The answer to that question remains a mystery, although there could be some evidence still to find from the body at the center of the web. It was Professor Parker who discovered the body. His regular visits to the web, bringing sheets of paper with him, had drawn the attention of a spider who lived right in the heart of it all, one known as the Fearless Leader. A group of spiders led Professor Parker through the trees towards his palace in the middle. 
Professor Parker had to duck and crawl under a number of dense webs. It didn't take a genius to work out that he was getting closer and closer to the origins of this colony. Web Zero, as it were. Out of a gap in a tree, an enormous wolf spider crawled out to meet him. It was hairy and gray, with strong legs and a slumping abdomen. Meekly, Professor Parker offered out the sheet of paper and pen to the fearless leader. You're not welcome here. We are the proletariat, united in our goals. You corrupt with your foreign ways and corporate greed. Professor Parker tried his best to explain that he was actually boycotting Nestle and had done a number of papers on the virtues of communism while at university. However, he did have to admit that he had invested fairly heavily in the stock exchange. The fearless leader bore its fangs at those words and stomped angrily, making its web sway and buckle underneath. We spiders do what we must to protect our commune. You are not welcome. It was at that point that Professor Parker saw the body for the first time. It was at his feet, shrunken and dry, past the point of smelling particularly putrid. Around the body were a number of small coins, bottle caps, and other shiny objects. It must have been the wolf spider's hall of wealth and riches. So much for equality for all. Did you kill this man? Professor Parker asked, suddenly feeling his blood running a little cold. Was that a set of eight legs tickling the back of his neck? Our actions are our own. Leave. But as Professor Parker walked away, he was fairly certain he had his answer already. The back of the man's head looked to have been caved in by some kind of blunt force impact, not something these spiders would be able to do on their own. Was that where their colony had first started? As soon as Professor Parker reported his findings to the Foundation, they launched a careful search of the surrounding area for any clues as to the man's identity, and within the hour, they were in luck. A wallet. There wasn't much inside. A couple of quarters, an old receipt so faded it couldn't provide much information, but by some miracle, there was still a driver's license. A match came back right away on the Foundation's database. He was a known political radical, expelled from a number of universities and fringe political groups for being a bit too much. Police reports pegged him as having gone missing in the small town in Texas in 1976. That date seemed to match up pretty well with the state of decomposition on the body. Investigations are still ongoing into the exact nature of this man's disappearance and what connections he had, if any, to the world of arachnology. It was far too coincidental that a group of spiders capable of communication and spouting extreme political rhetoric had just happened to create a colony on top of his corpse. But try as Professor Parker might, he couldn't get any information out of the spiders about the body. In a godless society, it was evident that their political views barred them from giving the corpse spiritual status. But when they talked about the body, it was evidently as close to a religious site as they were capable of conceding. Only one spider seemed to open up to Professor Parker. The spider had followed him out of the colony one evening after a long and fruitless day arguing about the benefits of privatizing certain industries. It swung down in front of him from a tree and waved him down right on the edge of the spider's territory. Professor Parker soon discovered that this spider was a worker spider, responsible for expanding the web little by little each day until it encompassed the whole world. Initially, the spider was just curious as to how long that would take, as in the previous 40 or so years, they had expanded by about 200 meters. The fearless leader apparently believed that the circumference of the world couldn't be much more than 500 meters, so they would soon be in possession of more than half of the available land. Laughing, Professor Parker gently explained that it would take a good while longer before humanity felt particularly worried. Much to his surprise, the spider seemed relieved. Evidently torn as to what to say, the spider looked from him to the colony and back, before writing down its next sentence on the paper. Screw Marxism. I just want to try a cheeseburger. That was the start of a peculiar kind of friendship between the pair. Every day, the spider would catch him on his way out and feed him whatever bits of information it had been privy to on the inside. That was no small task. The spiders had instituted a secret police, similar in hierarchy to the KGB, which kept tight control over the spread of information within the web. Professor Parker learned that the oldest spiders in the web had vague memories of being hatchlings in a bright white room, of being shaken around and transported somewhere, of sharp needles being injected into eggs, of booming literature being read out on repeat, so loud it would shake the webs beneath their feet, then chaos and fear, then freedom. Professor Parker got a number of small welts on his body over the next few weeks, 
little tiny bite marks from various harmless spiders. The worst that ever happened was he felt a slight itch for an hour or two before it would go down, and his skin would patch up the tiny bite marks. He would laugh about these bites with his spider friend as he brought him little scraps of McDonald's burgers to sample, but the spider was gravely serious as he chowed down on his minuscule mouthfuls of beef. Those bites are getting stronger. Rumor is that they are developing an ultra-venom, something that could take down a human. Fearless Leader is being humiliated by a human walking into his territory every day and knowing that he is powerless to stop it. One day, that will change. And one day, it did. Professor Parker lay on the grass with foam dribbling out of his mouth, knowing that he was about to die. His small spider companion, the friend that he had spent weeks getting to know, had been tortured and killed because of him. And now, it was his turn. All he could do was raise his arm limply and stare at the tiny arachnid clinging to it, the one whose teeth had plunged into his skin and killed him, the one who had been laid out on the web and tortured, the one whom he thought had been his friend. The spider hopped down and pulled a pen from Professor Parker's jacket pocket and wrote one last message on the back of his hand. Long live Marxism. Long live the spider proletariat. Death to our enemies. A D-Class drag races through the testing zone, screaming at the top of his lungs and doing donuts. A mime who is also in the testing chamber stares with disapproval, tapping his foot impatiently. Did we mention that the car is made of spiders? Yeah, this one is going to be a weird one, folks. Stay tuned for one of the craziest SCP stories you've ever heard. Emily had always dreamed of taking a trip to Paris. When the opportunity actually came to visit the city, she was overjoyed. She spent her time exploring art museums, tasting the bread and cheese, and walking through the city streets, taking in the sights. One of her favorite things about Paris was all of the street performers. As she walked, nibbling on a pain au chocolat, she delighted in the antics of jugglers, tossing colorful balls into the air. She gasped at the feat of athleticism and grace demonstrated by acrobats and contortionists. She giggled at the absurd shows put on by puppeteers and dabbed tears from her eyes at the sound of beautiful songs played and sung by musicians. It became part of her daily routine. One night, as Emily was walking back to her hostel after a long, languid dinner, she found herself walking down a street she had not encountered before. There was no one around except for her. It was a lovely moment of peace, but it also struck her as a little bit eerie, and she wished for the familiar throngs of people. Up ahead, she spotted the silhouette of another person and let out a sigh of relief. As she got closer, she could make out the black and white striped shirt, the suspenders, the black beret, the white face makeup, rouged cheeks, and red lips. A mime. A real, classic French mime. She couldn't believe her luck. When he spotted Emily approaching, the mime began to start a performance. He began with a classic, the invisible box. He felt around the walls of the invisible box, looking out with exaggerated wide eyes and an open mouth. Emily clapped and reached into her bag for a little bit of money she could use to tip him. After all, he was putting on a performance just for her. He deserved it. She walked closer to the mime, looking for a place to put her tip. She didn't see one, so she held up her hand, offering the money directly to the mime. As he took notice of how close she was getting, the mime began shaking his head vigorously, eyes wide and insistent. She didn't understand that he was trying to warn her until it was too late. Dozens and dozens of spiders began to crawl over the mime's face, out from inside of his clothes, from his shoes pouring out over the street and crawling up onto Emily. She tried to brush them off, she tried to run away, but no matter how hard she tried, the spiders just kept coming. All she could do was scream. In an attempt to experience a little bit of live performance, Emily unwittingly came across SCP-3247. SCP-3247 is a humanoid entity standing at approximately 1.7 meters in height. It wears a striped shirt and suspenders similar to the garb of a stereotypical French mime, as well as what appears to be white makeup on its face and all other exposed skin. Though these aspects of its appearance seem as if they should be removable, the clothing and makeup are, in fact, parts of the entity's physiology and cannot be removed from its body. This is not the only unusual aspect of the entity's physical form. Though it looks corporeal and solid, the entity cannot touch or directly interact with any solid matter, with one particular exception. 
there is a colony of spiders living on and inside of SCP-3247. These spiders have officially been designated SCP-3247-A and are highly protective of SCP-3247. If anyone or anything attempts to approach SCP-3247 in a threatening manner, the spiders will swarm the potential threat. As any savvy, anomalous activity enthusiast might have already gathered, these are, of course, no ordinary spiders. Not only do they dwell on and in an intangible mime, but they have a peculiar response to witnessing a human being making specific gestures or pantomiming activities. When this occurs, the colony of spiders will form the shape of an object related to the gestures, which they will then hold for up to three hours, or until given additional stimuli that prompt a change in shape. While the spider colony is assembled into shape, they will be able to share some of the given object's functions in spite of being technically nothing more than a mass of well-coordinated arachnids. As for SCP-3247, it is either incapable of speech or unwilling to speak. Instead, it communicates with Foundation staff via silent miming. When it does, the spiders will frequently react to its gestures, becoming effectively living props. SCP-3247 does not seem to be especially thrilled with this, likely because miming is inherently a propless art form, and these spider-based props undermine its artistic vision. Otherwise, though, the presence of the spiders does not seem to bother SCP-3247. In order to better understand the nature of SCP-3247-A, Foundation staff conducted a series of tests. In each test, a D-Class was given a gesture to perform in the presence of SCP-3247. Then, the research staff would record the spider colony's response. During the first test, the research staff ordered D-11424 to attempt to get as close to SCP-3247 as possible. They did not, of course, warn him about the spiders. He entered the testing chamber and approached the mime, who was pantomiming the act of climbing stairs. As the mime pretended to ascend an invisible staircase, and D-11424 grew closer, instances of SCP-3247-A emerged to take the shape of a staircase, much to the mime's frustration. SCP-3247 stopped its performance, throwing up its hands in a gesture of defeat. The spiders turned their attention to D-11424 and began to swarm him, treating him as a potential threat. Panicking and unsure how to communicate with SCP-3247 while the spiders were overpowering him, D-11424 began to wave frantically at the mime. The mime simply shrugged, giving him a look that said, Well, what do you want me to do about it? At this point, Control intervened, instructing D-11424 to pantomime some kind of activity. Fortunately, before turning to a life of crime, D-11424 had spent several years in a professional improv troupe and was well acquainted with pantomime. His performing instincts kicked in, and he leapt into action. He put a hand to his ear as if listening to the ringing of a telephone. The spiders stopped their attack, responding immediately to his cue. They formed into the shape of a small table with an old-fashioned rotary phone on top. The mime rolled its eyes in disdain at the sight of this prop-based performance, but D-11424 was on a roll. He crossed to the phone, picked up the receiver, and held it to his ear. Hello? He asked out of habit. He wasn't expecting to hear a voice on the other line, but then he did. Or rather, he heard the approximation of a human voice, created by a swarm of anomalous spiders. It sounded a bit like a human voice sped up, high-pitched, and squeaky, speaking some sort of gibberish. Realizing that this was his moment to escape, D-11424 placed the phone back in place and promptly left the testing chamber. The spiders remained in the shape of the rotary phone and the table for the next two hours, at which point they disassembled and returned to their home on SCP-3247. After his surprisingly creative work in this first test, it was decided that D-11424 would be the designated test subject for all future testing with SCP-3247, provided that additional complications did not arise. Though he wasn't especially fond of spiders, D-11424 was more than happy to accept the assignment, not that he had much choice in the matter. Still, it was definitely a better deal than getting fed to SCP-682, and it was a nice excuse to use his improv skills again after a long retirement. During the second test, D-11424 knew what to expect from SCP-3247. For this test, he was told to pantomime playing tug-of-war with an invisible opponent and an invisible rope. 
Now that he knew his improvisational scene partner would be a colony of spiders, he was able to enter the testing chamber with confidence. Once inside, he began to pantomime, pulling on a rope, having that rope tugged away from him by a strong opponent, and struggling to pull back. The spiders reacted right away, arranging themselves into the shapes of a long rope, one side of which was in D11424's hands, as well as a large humanoid, vaguely muscular in shape that was holding the other side of the rope. The spiders gave the rope a sharp tug, causing D11424 to lose his balance and fall over, the rope slipping out of his grasp. Aside from some injury to his pride, he was otherwise unharmed. During test number three, D11424 was instructed to enter the testing chamber and close his fist, while extending the thumb and index finger in a gesture colloquially known as finger guns. Sure enough, as soon as he assumed this position, the spiders assembled into the shape of a handgun. D11424 was then instructed to pick up the spider gun and squeeze the place where the trigger would be if it was a real gun and not, you know, spiders. A loud cracking sound was heard when the D-Class squeezed as a spider shot out of the barrel of the gun at high speed before smacking into the nearby wall, leaving a small hole in the surface. D11424 fired several more times, each shot firing an individual spider at a pace that attending researchers described as faster than a speeding bullet. After firing six rounds of spiders at the wall, D11424 was instructed to place the spider gun back on the ground. During test number 76, D11424 was ordered to hold his hands together and wiggle four fingers on each hand, effectively pantomiming a spider. The research team was curious to see what the spiders would do when presented with a shape that matched their usual unassembled form. SCP-3247, who generally did not react much to the experiments on its spiders, began shaking its head in mild disappointment as approximately 640 spiders emerged from its body, dividing themselves into groups of eight. Each group of eight spiders then joined to form one large spider, leaving eight spiders. These eight then split into pairs, who joined together into one larger spider, and so on and so forth until there was one single giant spider made from the hundreds of smaller spiders. At this point, D11424 followed his heart, jumping onto the mega spider's back and riding it like a bull at the rodeo, as the spider bucked and ran back and forth across the room. According to official transcripts, D11424 yelled, Yee-haw, throughout this part of the test, until the head researcher ordered him to climb down from the spider and exit the room. He was reprimanded for his behavior and warned that if he acted without approval again, he would be taken off the project and reassigned to a much less enjoyable position as one of the designated eyes on SCP-173. D-11424 immediately agreed to comply with future instructions. During test number 133, D-11424 was sent into the testing chamber and told to shadow box. He danced back and forth across the cell, doing his best Sylvester Stallone impression and throwing punches in the general direction of the spiders. In response, approximately 3,000 spiders poured out of SCP-3247, assembling into the shadowy shape of a boxer, and began to attack D-11424. The mass of spiders conducted itself at the level of a professional boxer, dodging D-11424's hits before coming back at him with a jab, cross, lead uppercut, and rear uppercut before he could defend himself. D-11424 fell to the ground unconscious, and guards were forced to interrupt the test in order to remove him from the room and take him to the infirmary for medical treatment. After taking some time to recuperate, D-11424 returned to testing with SCP-3247-A. He was instructed to mime steering a wheel, such as that of a car. Immediately, a number of spiders previously unseen during testing emerged from SCP-3247, arranging themselves into the shape of a sedan. D-11424 was then commanded to climb inside of the spider car and see if he could start it. He refused, insisting, I'm not getting in a spider car, are you nuts? When pressed by control to comply with orders, he made a rude hand gesture. I'll let you guess what that was. The spiders began to scramble to reassemble themselves in response to the changed gesture, prompting Control to stop the test early to spare the researchers' sensibilities. With strict guidelines to avoid inappropriate or violent gestures, D-11424 was sent back into the testing chamber with instruction to try out a variety of animal-inspired gestures in rapid succession. He formed one hand into a fist and made a peace sign with the other hand, putting them together to make a snail. 
As he made his hand snail crawl through the air, the spiders crawled onto the floor and assembled into the shape of a snail in front of D-11424. Though the spiders moved quickly, at their usual scuttling pace, once they formed into the snail, they slowed to a gradual creep. D-11424 noted a shiny, slimy trail left behind on the floor as the spider snail moved. He was asked to consider touching it, but refused, simply stating, Ew, no. Next, he took his hands and formed the shape of a wolf's head howling at the moon. The research staff were curious to see if the spiders would form a wolf's head or the animal's entire body. They got their answer as the spiders swarmed and shifted, forming the shape of a full-sized gray wolf. The wolf padded back and forth across the room before sitting down, lifting its head, and emitting an audible howl that sounded almost indistinguishable from the real thing. Next, D-11424 crossed his thumbs over each other, fluttering hands like a pair of wings. The spiders separated into smaller groups and came together to form butterflies similar in size to a monarch. These spider butterflies began to flap their wings and, much to D-11424's surprise, they took flight and swirled through the air around him. The D-Class was so moved by the beautiful sight that he shed a single tear, which he promptly wiped away out of embarrassment. Control then prompted him to try the next animal gesture. D-11424 used his hands to form the shape of a rabbit. Several of the spiders crawled away, returning to SCP-3247, and the remaining spiders took on the form of a rabbit. The spider rabbit hopped realistically around the room, twitching its ears and tail. At this point, D-11424 was instructed to offer the spider rabbit a carrot. He produced a carrot from his pocket, holding it out in front of him. The spider rabbit hopped over to him and, one crunch at a time, began to eat the carrot until none remained. D-11424 appeared shaken up and asked to leave the testing chamber. As he followed all of his instructions, this request was granted. When he exited the chamber, all he would say was, Where the hell did the carrot go? It doesn't have a stomach, it doesn't have a mouth, where did it go? SCP-3247 is kept in an isolated chamber located in the arachnid wing of Area 12. It does not appear to require food or rest, but it has been provided with a television and a collection of silent films for morale purposes. Instances of SCP-3247-A are fed via a fully automated system that dispenses 20 grams of live crickets every week. Should a containment breach occur, staff have been instructed to find a way to make escaped spiders take on the shape that renders them motionless, then simply pick the spider cluster up and place it back inside of the cell. It is unlikely that the Foundation will ever get an explanation for where the intangible mime and his merry band of spider performers originated from. But one thing is clear, they won't be performing in public again anytime soon. The creature let out an unmistakable squeal of rage as Stimulus Y-835 took effect. Dr. Christensen pressed his face up against the glass, eager to see the results. It had to work this time. It simply had to. He was certain that this attempt would make all the other failures worth it, and he'd once again prove the Foundation's faith in him to be well-placed. SCP-5683 shrieked a loud, insect-like sound that would have normally made the blood run cold of anyone that heard it. But to Dr. Christensen, it was like music, a monster's dying fanfare to mark his success. Soon he'd be the researcher who neutralized not one, but two tenacious, highly adaptable anomalies. The senior researcher could feel his heart racing as the deadly giant spider started to twitch, then burst into two identical entities. The pair of arachnid anomalies had reacted much like the results of the tissue sample tests conducted earlier, dividing into two separate organisms. Christensen held his breath. The tissue samples had destroyed each other, attacking and injecting the other with lethal doses of venom. Surely, he reasoned, duplicating SCP-5683 into two would have the same result. His heart sank as he watched one of the spider creatures, the duplicate, perish almost immediately. As it often did when presented with human prey, SCP-5683 attacked using its mandibles and impaled its copy with its front legs to pin it in place. The clone had bitten back, with Dr. Christensen already knowing that would have granted SCP-5683 an immunity to its own venom. Its powers of adaptation were fiercely, frustratingly efficient and nothing demonstrated this more than the intense reaction from the man tasked with destroying it. Dr. Christensen hurled the nearest object, 
a coffee mug at a glass window of the observation room, overlooking the test chamber. He pounded his fist against the glass, hardly with the required force to cause damage, but enough to send pain shooting down Christensen's wrist, which then nestled in his forearm, a reminder that the experiment, like the others, had failed. Why can't I destroy you? He muttered through clenched teeth, looking with hatred at the enormous spider in the chamber below. The directive had reached him the day immediately after New Year's Day 2020, and straight from a member of the O5 Council, no less. Their message expressed how impressed the Council was with Dr. Christensen's success with the Doomsday Clock project, and how favorably his name had been mentioned in Council meetings. This boded well for the ambitious Foundation doctor. He'd been hoping to snag the director position at Site-04, now that Director Bray had retired. But there was one more test from the O5 Council. They wanted Dr. Christensen to use the knowledge garnered during his previous success to solve the SCP-5683 problem. If he could successfully complete that assignment, it would be his ticket to being promoted. With the comfy role of site director and all its perks in mind, Dr. Christensen accepted the assignment from the Council to deal with SCP-5683. SCP-5683 was quite the beast, not an anomaly for those with intense arachnophobia. The huge spider-like organism was extremely hostile towards humans and had to be kept in a constant state of medical sedation. Otherwise, it would relentlessly attempt to breach containment and slaughter any and all personnel in its path. What had made SCP-5683 such a problem for the Foundation was the creature's ability to rapidly regenerate damage as well as modify its own body in reaction to threats. Much like a certain, particularly hard-to-destroy reptile, the spider-like entity could adapt itself to become more resistant to any danger posed to it. And of course, this meant that the Foundation needed this dangerous creature eradicated. The frequent containment breaches and sheer number of casualties caused by the arachnid anomaly were significant enough to cause an increasing drain on the SCP Foundation's resources. So, with the termination order coming from the very top, the O5 Council themselves, Dr. Christensen was tasked with overseeing the neutralization of SCP-5683. During an initial deliberation, Dr. Christensen met with researcher Miles and Hall, junior researcher Silva, and security chief Ade to discuss earlier attempts to terminate SCP-5683. The new head of the termination project was perturbed to learn that the research team had little in the way of useful information to offer beyond what the Foundation already knew about the creature. But Christensen decided some basic stress testing would at least be a start. After a successful tissue sample test, wherein some of SCP-5683's genetic material was incinerated, Dr. Christensen tried to simply destroy the spider with fire. An understandable response, to say the least. However, exposing SCP-5683 to temperatures of 850 degrees Celsius for just 30 seconds didn't quite yield the easy victory he had hoped for. The arachnid thrashed about and screeched in reaction to the heat, only to rapidly develop a form of armor plating covering its entire body. The armor was comprised of an unknown, unidentifiable substance, but it was enough to prevent SCP-5683 from combusting. Reconvening with the rest of the team, Dr. Christensen hid his pride, assuring everyone he was just trying to establish a baseline during the previous test. Of course, he hadn't believed that terminating SCP-5683 with fire would be a success, or so he claimed, hiding how much he'd longed for an easy solution so he could snatch up the vacant Site-04 director position. But to ensure the others, Christensen explained that he'd requisitioned some anomalous materials from the O5 Council that they'd be using in their next termination attempts. Nothing that was anomalous enough to require containment, but toxic enough that they presented a few options for destroying SCP-5683. Uh, just for logging purposes, sir, may I inquire about the specific substances we're shipping in? Junior researcher Sylvia had asked. Of course. Y220, Y835, and Y43. Dr. Christensen quickly recounted them all from memory. I'm told they should be arriving within the week. I expect each would be enough to do the job, but it's best to hedge our bets. This spider doesn't compare to the lizard, I'll tell you that. Junior researcher Silva seemed to take an interest in what Dr. Christensen had just alluded to, 
his previous work with the Lizard. He probed further about it, and Christensen gave a solemn response. The aspiring Foundation doctor recalled an incident from a few years earlier during his experimentation with SCP-682. Some of the methods Dr. Christensen had opted to employ in an attempt to destroy the hard-to-destroy reptile had led to a severe containment breach. When describing it, he used the word unpleasant, perhaps out of guilt at how many personnel had lost their lives due to his actions. Brushing the topic aside, he assured the team to get on with testing the new anomalous stimuli on SCP-5683. Stimulus Y220 initially showed some promise. During a tissue sample test, it successfully converted part of SCP-5683 into glass, which then violently exploded, leaving nothing behind. But attempts to use it to neutralize the creature itself quickly quashed those promising results. Within nine seconds of being exposed to stimulus Y220, SCP-5683's body rapidly turned to glass. Around 80% of its arachnid mass proceeded to explode, shattering in all directions, sending clear shards showering over the testing chamber. As he watched, Dr. Christensen allowed himself to believe that this was mission accomplished, that he'd successfully terminated SCP-5683. But his celebration was premature. The spider quickly began reconstituting itself, its body regenerating within the space of 30 seconds. After testing with both stimuli Y220 and Y835, Dr. Christensen's frustration seemed to be increasing with each failed attempt. He knew his promotion was within reach, and as far as he could remember, he'd done good work with damaging SCP-682. Why should eradicating this anomalous spider be any different? However, it was a test with stimulus Y-436 that enraged the ambitious doctor. Expecting the anomalous stimulant to turn SCP-5683 into a fine mist, Christensen watched as the creature's body vanished, literally vaporizing, changing states of matter to little more than water in the air. Suddenly, every light in the facility powered off, plunging the testing chamber into darkness. When the lights came back on, SCP-5683 was standing on all eight legs, right where it had been missed only three seconds earlier. The research team had gathered for another mediation, and Dr. Christensen's anger still hadn't subsided. He kicked a chair to emphasize his frustration, alarming junior researcher Silva, who urged him to calm down. After eventually cooling his temper, Christensen made an announcement that caused even greater concern to spread amongst the team. I'm requisitioning Y-910. Researcher Halls and Researcher Miles objected, trying to get Dr. Christensen to realize that the course of this action was excessive, overkill even. But Christensen disregarded them, standing by his latest method for terminating SCP-5683. The Global Occult Coalition had previously used Y-910 to poison gods. He felt sure that it would work on one anomalous giant spider. His time was running short. Dr. Christensen was aware that any day now, the O5 Council would be appointing a replacement director of Site-04, and he wanted that promotion. And he didn't seem to care what corners he cut and what risks he took to get there, even if it meant endangering his research personnel. Dr. Christensen declared that in order to save time, he would be bypassing tissue samples to test for termination attempts. The longer it took to terminate the anomalous arachnid, the more his window of opportunity closed, and the further the director position slipped from his fingertips. Accepting full responsibility for the reckless decision and anything that might go wrong, Dr. Christensen wanted to use Stimulus Y-910 directly on SCP-5683. He urged the research team to make the necessary preparations, unaware of what his decision would lead to and the chaos it had already caused. The test was catastrophic, so much so that it caused a containment breach. With SCP-5683 loose and scuttling about the facility on its multiple legs, Dr. Christensen and junior researcher Silva were forced to rush to the secure bunker on site for safety. Christensen was in a state of panic until he noticed something, and not for the first time either. He'd been detecting a foul smell whenever he'd conducted the meetings to discuss termination options. But the other members of the research team had quickly explained it was nothing more than repeated accidents in the cafeteria. But here was the stench again, worse than ever. Yet junior researcher Silva brushed it off again, stating that SCP-5683 must have gotten into the facility's reactor. The junior researcher quickly became inconsolable, stating that the whole situation was his fault. Dr. Christensen interjected, 
demanding to know how it was and what Silva had done to cause this situation. He replied that it was his duty to oppose ill-advised actions, and when Christensen had declared his intention to use Y910, the junior researcher hadn't opposed him. Shifting the blame from himself onto his subordinate, Dr. Christensen chastised Silva over how many personnel had died because of the junior researcher's refusal to do his job, ignoring that it was Christensen's own ambitions that had led to the current chaos. Refusing to be made a scapegoat, Dr. Christensen vowed to pin the full culpability for SCP-5683's containment breach onto junior researcher Silva, saying he'd tell the O5 Council the so-called truth about what had happened. But Silva pointed out that there wasn't much of a likelihood that the bunker would survive the reactor overloading. He urged the ambitious Foundation doctor to admit some responsibility of his own for what had happened, but Christensen refused. Suddenly, there came a thunderous banging at the bunker door. A debilitating pang of fear struck Dr. Christensen, causing him to scream and retreat from the entrance, yelling, No, and please, as if he was pleading with the universe itself to spare him from the spider. Junior researcher Silva walked over to the bunker door, just as strong, arachnid legs tore the heavy steel bulkhead off its hinges, like it was made of little more than wet paper. There was SCP-5683, the enormous spider skittering into the bunker, screeching all the while. Silva had put himself between SCP-5683 and the ambitious Foundation Doctor, whose hunger for a promotion had led to all this carnage. The junior researcher announced his noble intention to sacrifice himself, occupying the creature while urging Christensen to run. The doctor shoved Silva towards the spider and prepared to run, then all of a sudden, SCP-5683 vanished. Junior researcher Silva told Dr. Christensen he was disappointed, before researcher Miles, researcher Hall, and security chief Ade all entered the bunker through the torn open hole where the door had been. Christensen questioned where SCP-5683 had gone, to which Silva explained there was little reason to keep a dummy around once it had served its purpose as a substitute. You mentioned you worked with a lizard, sir, the junior researcher recounted that there was a containment breach. If you don't terribly mind me asking, how did you escape that situation? It seemed quite lethal, didn't it? Afraid and confused, Dr. Christensen asked where he was. Hall and Miles urged him not to ask questions he already knew the answer to. Silva explained who they all were, a jury, specifically Dr. Christensen's jury. And according to them, the ambitious doctor had disgraced himself again. Christensen had been there for a long time, a considerably long time, reliving the same events over and over again, with SCP-5683 acting as a substitute for SCP-682. It was the same situation, he'd made the same decisions, the same mistakes, and it had cost lives. Now Dr. Christensen was trapped in an endless loop, penance for the casualties that had occurred at his hands all in the pursuit of his own selfish personal gain. He asked the jury how long he'd be stuck there, a question Silva responded to with, Until you take responsibility, sir. Immediately, Dr. Christensen tried to admit that this all had been his fault, but he didn't mean it. Not really. He hadn't accepted blame. He just wanted a quick and easy way out of the loop, and the jury of his deceased personnel knew it. Christensen ran for the door in the hopes of escaping his fate, Futile as his chances were, a black iron chain appeared from around the corner and wrapped itself around the overambitious doctor's throat, ignorant of his pleas for forgiveness, saying he was sorry wouldn't bring back the people who died in service of his aspirations to becoming a site director. The chain dragged Dr. Christensen through the facility at such a speed that he collided with every wall and every corner as he turned sharply, being pulled along the floor. But that and the walls quickly crumbled away, revealing a sight that made Dr. Christensen start screaming that it wasn't his fault, and he never really stopped. What followed involved a great deal of blood and fire. Once it was over, it left behind the same awful stench the doctor had smelt before, and he'd soon be smelling it again too, as the cycle repeated itself. The directive had come straight from a member of the O5 Council. They were impressed with Dr. Christensen, and the ambitious Foundation doctor had been hoping to snag a director position at Site-04. But there was one final test, 
for Dr. Christensen to solve the SCP-5683 problem. There's been a strange phenomenon sweeping central Germany. While the true extent of its influence is still unknown, it seems to have been going on for quite some time now, usually in irregular intervals. If you were to head down to any of the towns within the affected region for a visit, the chances of you noticing anything out of the ordinary would still be rather low. But then again, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, it's entirely possible you could witness an occurrence of SCP-3023, every arachnophobe's worst nightmare. One terrifying incident happened at a baseball game held during the height of the summer. With the scorching sun hanging high above a stadium packed with eager fans, the home team was neck and neck with their longtime rivals from the next town over. As the players took to the field after a changeover, everything hung in the balance. The home team's coach had made a bold change, sending out a new baseman, a young man named Jenik Denke. He was a rookie, untested, but the team's strongest veterans had been doing their best through the whole first half of the game, and still, the scores were almost tied. And so Janik stepped up to the base, unaware that making the next catch would change his life forever. The crowd was silent, the tensions flattening their cheers and chants to a low murmur as the rival's heaviest hitter stepped up to the bat. He was a behemoth arms twice the size of the baseball bat he carried over his broad shoulder, striding up with confidence as he readied a swing. Watching and waiting, a bead of sweat rolled down Janik's forehead, dropping down the bridge of his nose. He couldn't tell which was making him sweat more, the heat of the sun or his own nerves. His teammate at the pitcher's mound lifted a leg, the baseball in hand. If he gripped the ball any tighter, his fingernails might have splintered and got lodged in the white synthetic leather wrapped around it. Janik stared, not even bothering to wipe away the drops of sweat in his eyes. As his teammate's throwing arm reeled back and hurled the ball forward, it felt like time itself had slowed down. The rival team's batter swatted the baseball out of the air with an earth-shattering crack that sent the ball speeding through the air. Janik dashed to catch it, his mitt outstretched. The ball was careening back down to earth like a white and red meteorite almost moving fast enough to burn up on re-entry as it hurled through the atmosphere. Janik could feel his heart rattling against his ribcage as every instinct told him he'd never make that fateful catch. In a final act of desperation, he leaped off the ground with every ounce of strength and all around him the crowd exploded with the thunderous sounds of overjoyed applause. The mighty force of the weighty cork ball was like catching a punch in midair, the tremors of the impact rippling down Janik's arm. He felt that first, before realizing that the ball was now lodged securely in his hand. He'd done it. He'd made the catch. The batter was out. But before he could even react in celebration, it <laughs> happened. His arm recovered from the initial shock of the catch just in time to feel the lightning-fast flurry of small legs scuttling over his skin. Barely able to catch his breath, the last thing Janik saw was something that used to be the baseball, hurriedly crawling up his chest towards his neck. From a distance, his teammates, the fans in the audience, only saw him drop to the turf, flailing his arms trying to brush off something crawling over him as it attacked and killed the young baseman in what otherwise would have been the proudest moment of his life. While that might have been the first time anything like that had ever happened, it certainly wouldn't be the last. Now, have you ever passed by an abandoned building and felt an urge to look around inside? Of course, a lot of us have. But most of us are smart enough to resist the urge. But on the very rare times you and your friends have worked up the courage to explore somewhere like this, you've probably never found anything all that interesting. Then again, you might want to think twice before sneaking past those keep out and condemn signs. Maxie and Iva learned that lesson the hard way when they gained access to an abandoned office block. Maybe they were trying their hand at making a Blair Witch Project-style amateur found footage movie, or they could have been dabbling in some urban exploration. Best case, there might have been a few places of office furniture left behind by the building's previous occupants, something that the removal company forgot to take when the place was cleared out. The pair of them could have just helped themselves. After all, they needed a new folding chair for their apartment, and there was one just sitting there. Trembling through her stifled tears, Iva's phone was shuddering in her hand. The office had been dark, 
but she was certain the shadowy shape that had taken Maxie didn't belong to a human being. Clamping her hand over her mouth to silence her terrified breaths, she peered out from under the desk, pointing her phone's camera wherever she looked as it recorded. Iva could hear the loud tapping of several metal legs, moving hurriedly around the empty office. The noise would pause at irregular intervals. Every time it stopped, she thought, no, prayed that the creature was gone. But just as Iva went to look, she would hear the same sound, quick, scampering steps, the kind of movements that feel unnatural to look at, that are only possible for things with eight legs. Perhaps that made it worse. The creature didn't shriek or scream or breathe like you'd expect of some awful monster in a horror movie. But then again, how could it? It had been a chair when Maxie had walked up to it, nothing more than an ordinary folding chair. The patter of metal footsteps stopped again, this time for longer. It had to be gone now, she thought. She gave it another few seconds just to make sure the silence wasn't broken again. Crawling out from under the desk, her phone still in her hand, Iva allowed herself to breathe a tentative sigh, only for that sigh to become a scream as it lunged at her, the chair's seat and back now the body and maw of an angry arachnid monster. As Iva screamed, her phone caught the whole gruesome sight on camera. You might be starting to see a pattern emerging here, but there's yet another twist in this multi-legged tale. What if these occurrences weren't just random incidents? Sure, they might fall into the freak of nature category like so many other anomalous incidents, but while it's unclear exactly how these particular anomalies come about, could it be possible that something, or someone, is creating them on purpose? Mobile Task Force Alpha-21 were already on the scene in the aftermath of the latest incursion. The Elite Foundation strike team had eliminated the threat. Luckily, it had started life as a phone, meaning they were able to remotely destroy it, causing its electronic components to detonate. Not before it had killed two Foundation personnel, though. Naturally, now came the cleanup operation, gathering up evidence leaving no trace of what had happened. The SCP Foundation still had little clue as to what exactly caused instances of this nature, a phenomenon they had now designated as SCP-3023. All they had to go on was a handful of cases, and footage recovered from a cell phone that had belonged to an urban explorer who'd met an untimely end at the jaws of a folding chair. But speaking of footage, Something unusual had been caught by a security camera a few days before the latest SCP-3023 incident. The security footage showed a man breaking into an office where the latest 3023 instance, the telephone, had been found. As he picked up the phone in question, this individual's jaw appeared to unnaturally split open horizontally, allowing four dark, tongue-like appendages to emerge. These appendages rubbed the phone for over half a minute before retracting. The man then returned the phone to its original place and promptly left the office. Thanks to further investigations conducted by the Foundation's forensic experts, this unknown individual was identified as Mr. Sar, the owner of a local restaurant. Naturally, MTF Alpha 21 moved in to apprehend this suspect, the only real lead as to what has been causing the multiple instances of SCP-3023 to begin occurring in Germany. However, when Sar was eventually detained, he showed next to no sign of any anomalies in his body. He claimed to have no memory of the events depicted in the security footage, had never encountered any previous SCP-3023 instance, and seemed to possess no knowledge of the strange properties he exhibited on camera. Nonetheless, the SCP Foundation was forced to detain Mr. Sar, although he never displayed any anomalous behavior ever again. Now, you might be forgiven for thinking that, with Soror held in Foundation custody, everyone could breathe a sigh of relief. But sadly, for any arachnophobes watching at home, new instances of SCP-3023 kept cropping up, in even stranger and more horrific fashion than ever before. Imagine you had a headache, and we're talking about a real killer here. One of those power drill to the frontal lobe migraines. Maybe you'd spend too much time glued to a computer screen at work and all that blue light from your monitor scrambled your gray matter. Or perhaps last night was a pretty wild one, and after a few too many drinks, you were left feeling hung over the next morning. What's your go-to response in that situation? Obviously, you can call in sick to work, then go to your medicine cabinet or an over-the-counter pharmacy and grab some basic painkillers. Paracetamol, aspirin, ibuprofen, all the things that we trust to make us feel better not to make things even worse. To Patrick, this started as one of the most normal things in the world. 
like you or I, his immediate response to finding himself suffering from a raging headache was to grab a gelatin capsule of ibuprofen. As casually and unsuspectingly as anyone would, he took the pill in hopes of quickly relieving his pain and carrying on with his day, probably even chasing it down with a quick glass of water. Only unbeknownst and unseen to Patrick, something happened the moment that ibuprofen capsule passed through his lips and went towards his throat. Something that stopped it from fully going down his throat, in fact. Much like the baseball, the folding chair, the phone, and who knows how many other unrecorded incidents, the pill had sprouted eight spider-like legs. At first, it started as a gentle cough, like you'd expect when a capsule gets lodged in your throat. Grabbing a tissue, Patrick gave a few grunting attempts at clearing his airway. There was definitely something in there that almost felt like it was scratching. Not the kind of scratch at the back of the throat brought on by some allergies, the kind of scratching that caused Patrick to cough up blood when he put a tissue to his mouth, the kind of scratching that he could feel moving, crawling around his windpipe. Perhaps if he had more time, Patrick could have raced to the hospital and had whatever was clawing its way around his throat removed safely with that free European healthcare. Unfortunately, the thing that the capsule had turned into just as he swallowed it wasn't that kind. Racked with unimaginable pain, Patrick was writhing and spluttering uncontrollably, his mouth filled with more bile and blood than saliva at that point. The scratching was moving, and not down towards his esophagus towards his stomach. It was going outwards, burrowing through the insides of his neck until it reached his spinal cord. By that time, the little ibuprofen capsule-sized instance of SCP-3023 came crawling out from the back of his neck. Patrick was already dead. Let's say you were aware of this, of all these strange happenings, seemingly ordinary everyday objects turning into angry, aggressive spiders. Obviously, the Foundation might want to have a little chat with you about how you came across such information, but for the sake of argument, imagine you did know. You might think the smart idea would be to leave. After all, SCP-3023 instances are only known to occur in a specific region of central Germany, neatly situated in the middle of Leipzig and Dusseldorf. So you might think that it's time to up sticks and leave that area, maybe even leave Germany altogether. Just hop in your car and drive to safety, if only it were that easy. A family of four was cruising down the Autobahn in an SUV, just another car on the packed highway. Exhausted after hours on the road, Matteo and Nina sat quietly up front, making sure they didn't wake their son and daughter, both asleep in the rear passenger seats. The car was picking up speed, about to pass 70 miles per hour as it gradually carried them home, although it wasn't going to get them all the way back. The screech of twisting metal woke both sleeping kids up screaming, their parents equally shocked at the sudden noise. The car lurched and buckled like something had collided with it. But this was no ordinary traffic accident. Without any rhyme or reason, the front of their SUV warped itself into the distinctive shape of a cephalothorax, while the rear turned into what looked like an abdomen. As the car shifted and reshaped around them, the grinding of metal as auto parts became huge metal legs. Matteo, Nina, and their children were still trapped inside, never to make it out. But the creepy crawly carnage wasn't just contained inside the car. The newly born arachnid abomination hurtled its way down the autobahn, managing to maintain its speed. Other drivers swerved and slammed on their brakes to avoid hitting the creature they couldn't even believe was scuttling hurriedly along the highway. Unfortunately, this led them to careening into other cars, smashing headfirst into a pileup that claimed the lives of 41 people. Not that the SCP Foundation would ever admit it. With one of their facilities only 250 meters away, they were quick to dispatch an airstrike to deal with the spidery SUV once it became clear that Mobile Task Force Alpha 21 couldn't contain it. Across the board, anything capable of sprouting four pairs of spindly legs and crawling towards you with the intent to kill tends to rack up quite the body count, but dealing with bodies are some people's business. That was the case for Lucas, a newly qualified coroner. After passing years of training, he was working with the local police department, performing autopsies and examining bodies to help them with their investigations. Sure, it may not have been the most glamorous profession, but Lucas could sleep soundly, knowing that he'd never get hurt by a dead body. A John Doe, a body that hadn't yet been identified, had just been brought in after police had found him on the side of the road. Lucas thoroughly washed his hands, put on his gloves and scrubs, along with the rest of the autopsy team. 
He'd sat in on at least a dozen of these procedures, studied the relevant process and techniques. Everything had prepared him for the job of figuring out how someone had died. But not even the most experienced medical examiner could be prepared for what happened next. Taking the lead, Lucas began by making the primary incision into the cadaver's chest. It always reminded him of a particular scene in The Thing, where a character's stomach opened up and became a maw of frightening teeth, revealing them to be the titular shape-shifting alien. That thought was quickly shaken away when suddenly, to Lucas's surprise, the body lurched violently on the examining table. Not everyone expects dead bodies to be able to move, and while it might be rare, it's also not impossible. Any number of things can cause someone's remains to move after death, muscles atrophying or spasming, the body filling up with gas as it breaks down. Of course, any coroner would expect these movements to have subsided by the time someone reaches the autopsy room. Caught off guard by the sudden violent movement, Lucas stepped away, dropping his scalpel. His panting breath warmed his face beneath his surgical mask as he stared for a moment, waiting to see if the body moved again. Certain it would be still now, Lucas wrote the spooky incident off just as a muscle spasm and leaned over to retrieve his scalpel. But while he was crouching, he noticed something strange. It almost looked as if there were a pair of protrusions poking out from under the dead man's skin. Walking around the other side of the table, Lucas found two more similar lumps at the body's abdomen, almost as if something was inside, ready to force its way out. Without warning, the John Doe suddenly moved again on the examining table, only this time, it didn't stop. Lucas couldn't believe his eyes. The man's face was still, frozen in the same dead expression, but his arms and legs were thrashing and writhing around as if he was somehow still alive. Four extra limbs suddenly burst from the sides of the cadaver, and the now eight-legged creature reared itself up, leaping towards a member of the autopsy team. It scuttled and skittered around on its new appendages while Lucas watched in horror. Blood-curdling screams filled the autopsy room as he bolted for the door. Lucas raced down the corridor. The coroner dared not looking behind him while sprinting through the city mortuary. Behind him, he could hear the thudding of the spider's multiple limbs right at his heels. Out of the corner of his eyes, right on the edge of his peripheral vision, he could see the mass of legs scuttling towards him. Maybe he would get out, run all the way to safety before the spider was upon him. But how can you hope to outrun something with eight legs when you only have two? The most important thing to remember is that while any unsuspecting inanimate object near you might suddenly decide to become an angry spider, the chances of it happening are very, very low. But especially if you happen to be in central Germany, those chances are never zero either. Disturbing things had been happening on the fifth floor of the Rose Heights apartment building in Albany, New York. Residents had reported strange noises over the last few days, screaming in the night, pained muttering, soft weeping, scratching and scuttling in the walls, and worst of all, what seemed like an infestation of bugs unlike anything the unfortunate occupants of Rose Heights had ever seen before. They weren't abnormal in size or shape, they looked an awful lot like the common earwig, around two and a half centimeters long with large curved pinchers on the back. But the color wasn't right. Unlike the usual dark brown, these earwigs were a silverly, almost translucent gray. When people spotted them crawling across their walls or hiding in the carpet, they seemed to shimmer in the light. Eventually, the building's landlady, Donna Tompkins, was called in to do something about the infestation. She spoke to each of the residents about their experience. They reported the strange noises, the mysterious bugs, and even a funny smell they'd sometimes catch in the hall. A smell like someone had thrown up. And every single person that Donna spoke to couldn't help but remark that the smell was particularly strong outside the apartment of a certain resident, Bill Parham. Stranger still was the fact that Bill hadn't been seen in days. Donna knocked on his door, but received no answer. She called him on his cell phone and could hear the phone ringing inside the apartment, but it just went to voicemail. When she checked the security footage of the lobby, she saw that Bill hadn't left the building in the last few days either. Donna called the police, worried that Bill might be sick or even dead inside his apartment. It was strange, given that he was only in his 30s and didn't seem to have any health conditions. But stranger things had happened. 
much stranger things were about to happen too. Two police officers arrived not long after. They called through the door one more time, and when they got no response, Donna gave them the key to head inside. The apartment was a wreck. All the furniture was covered in dust. Filthy dishes were piled high in the sink and on the draining board. The smell of rot was thick in the air. There were empty boxes of painkillers. All the pills popped from their silvery foil laying on the ground. But worst of all were the bugs. The apartment was crawling with them, and they were on every surface. Those silvery gray earwigs. Neither of the officers liked bugs, and it seemed like the deeper they got into the apartment, the more bugs there were. Some even seemed to be crawling towards them, pointing their pinchers at them as though they were defending their territory. This looked to be a textbook case of what happens when a resident keels over and dies. But there was just one problem. Where was the body? Bill Parham had seemingly dropped off the face of the earth, and now a colony of mysterious bugs had started squatting in his apartment in his absence. Then came that smell again. That truly awful smell like bile and blood. It was even stronger now, and it seemed like it was coming from a nearby closet. The two officers acting on pure instinct drew their weapons and approached the closet with caution. Even if they weren't consciously aware of it, they knew they were going to find something awful inside. Something evil. Something dangerous. When they threw open the closet door, they couldn't help but scream. They'd found the nest. It was a huge round hive, like the biggest beehive you've ever seen melded into the lower corner of the closet. The unnatural earwigs were crawling into, out of, and around it. Thousands of them. Tens of thousands of them. And the second they registered the presence of the two officers, intruders into their nest, they began to swarm. In sheer panic, both raised their guns and opened fire into the closet, but it didn't do them any good. Their bullets just pierced and splintered the hive, causing even more enraged insects to spill out and begin crawling over the two cops. They fled from the apartment, screaming in pain from the gnashing pincers of the insects crawling all over their skin. They never did find the corpse of Bill Parham. But that's because Bill Parham wasn't dead. At least not until mere moments ago, when the bullets from the cops' gun had torn through his bones and perforated his organs. He died not long after, and if he could still speak close to the end, he would have thanked them both for the mercy. Because the monstrosity that they'd just encountered in the closet wasn't just a nest of mysterious insects in Bill Parham's apartment, it was Bill himself. This is the fate worse than death in store for anyone supremely unlucky enough to fall victim to SCP-439, better known by the nickname for their unique nests, the Bone Hive. And while these nasty little critters may be small, they're filled with enough pure nightmare fuel to send you running into 682's containment chamber for a little comfort. Let's go through this whole nightmarish process and tell you exactly what happened to poor Bill Parham. First discovered by the SCP Foundation in mainland China, SCP-439 specimens largely get by on the fact that they're not much to look at. Unless you're an entomologist, when you see a strange insect, you probably just accept the fact that it's a perfectly normal breed you've just never encountered before. Nobody is hammering down the doors of their local news station to alert the press about the gray earwig they saw crawling out of a crack in their bathroom wall. But if Bill Parham had done just that, it would have saved his life. The Foundation would have immediately flagged the incident as an SCP-439 infestation and dispatched a mobile task force to deal with it. Instead, when Bill saw the earwig for the first time, he was getting ready for work and didn't have the time to stop and deal with it. He made a mental note to buy some bug killer on the way home, but quickly forgot. The insect didn't forget him, though. In fact, it thought he would be a perfect candidate for the SCP-439 process. The Foundation has tested extensively with the one SCP-439 sample they'd been able to successfully catch and contain. In all tests, they found that 439 specimens rejected hosts from any species other than humans. They're an extraordinarily specific parasite. It's also only one particular type of SCP-439 specimen that you actually need to worry about. The Queens. Despite their superficial similarities, SCP-439 behave nothing like non-anomalous earwigs. Normal earwigs are not social creatures. 
They're solitary scavengers and they don't keep nests as permanent habitats. The same can definitely not be said for SCP-439. They have complex social structures, much like that of bees, ants, and termites with queens, scouts, workers, and warriors. If you happen to encounter a worker or a warrior, you may get a painful pinch from their pinchers if you get too close. But if you end up on the wrong side of one of the queens, then you have a much, much worse fate in store for you. And it just so happened that the SCP-439 specimen that appeared in Bill Parham's bathroom that morning was visiting royalty. This 439 queen had selected her target, and now, it was time to move to the next part of the process. Initial Infiltration When Bill returned home from work, he was delighted to find that the gray earwig was nowhere to be seen, but that didn't mean it was gone. It was still there lurking, it just didn't want to be seen. After all, the real fun would happen after Bill went to bed. Once SCP-439 detects that its potential host has fallen into a deep sleep, it will crawl onto the person's body and into their mouth, which is exactly what it did to Bill. It feels like little more than a tickle in your throat, and you will have no idea that the tiny creature crawling down your windpipe and into the soft, warm tissue of your lungs spells your doom. Very few people wake up during this process, but even if they did, there's virtually nothing they could do. When Bill woke up, he was suffering from mild chest pains and shortness of breath a symptom not uncommon in a number of respiratory ailments. He had no idea that the SCP-439 queen was already inside him. He got up and went about his day, trying to ignore the pain as it gradually grew worse and worse, feeling almost like something was moving inside his chest. He spent the whole day having to stop to let out a deep, hacking cough, but coughing didn't expel or change anything. He looked and felt so terrible that his boss let him go home early, hoping that Bill would be able to sleep off whatever illness he thought he had picked up. But over the next couple of days, his condition only worsened. The pain grew so excruciating he could barely move, and he was popping painkillers like Tic Tacs to no effect. He started running a dangerously high fever, his body trying in vain to fight back against its lethal intruder. He felt worse than he ever had in his life, but little did poor Bill know, the most terrible parts of the process were yet to come. Through anomalous means, an SCP-439 infection is able to induce fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP, in its victims, which is typically a genetic disease that presents itself before the victim turns 10 years old. The condition is infamous for its primary symptom, turning muscle and other soft tissue into bone slowly but surely paralyzing the victim and putting them into a state of unspeakable pain. This bone transformation process is known as ossification, and Bill was about to experience it firsthand. His pain increased as his mobility decreased, with more of his flesh becoming solid lumps of bone underneath the skin. Soon enough, all he knew was pain. It became so agonizing that he was delirious with it, he was drunk on pain. Even perceiving sunlight felt like being stabbed in the eyes. That's why, like all the other victims of SCP-439, he decided to conceal himself in a warm, dark place where no light could get to him. In Bill's case, of course, that place was his closet. He was hurting so bad that all he could do was curl up into the fetal position and weep as his muscles turned to bone and his body began to compact and shrink. He didn't even look like a human anymore. He was more like a ball, covered in a bone shell and filled with warm organs. That's when the queen started laying eggs among his organs. It wasn't long before there was a new brood of around 30,000 specimens living inside Bill's body. He was still very much alive, but there wasn't anything he could do about his situation. His muscles had long since turned to bone, and they had eaten large portions of his brain, leaving mainly the parts needed to keep his organs just barely functioning. After all, the colony still needs central heating. SCP-439 colonies have developed a perfect parasitic relationship with the human body. They even use the stomach inside the hive to pre-digest food into a liquid slurry that's easier for them to consume. The only loser in this situation is someone like Bill who is forced to become the new home for the world's most nightmarish freeloaders. 
Eventually, when the colony becomes too big, a queen departs to start a new one, and the process repeats itself once more. It's enough to make you want to sleep with your mouth closed for the rest of your life. Oh, and we haven't even told you the worst part yet. Foundation scientists have conducted tests on some victims of SCP-439 and found that while the creatures do consume large parts of the brain, the parts they leave are capable of consciousness. That's right. Their victims remain aware of what's happening to them the whole time, even when they hardly seem human at all anymore. What actually finally kills the victims of SCP-439 isn't the bodily trauma. It's the starvation that sets in when the colony inevitably moves on. Did we just hear you cough? You might want to go get that checked out. When it comes to bugs, the SCP Foundation certainly has its hands full. You might remember SCP-726, a species of bowfly aptly named the Reconstructive Maggots, who recreated the bodies of other organisms through horrible reproduction methods. There's also SCP-2031, a colony of anomalous ants that would eat their victims' insides and burrow themselves in the bodies, puppeting them around and masquerading as the creature they just ate, even if it was a person. Today on SCP Explained, we're going to be talking about a new species of anomalous insect, SCP-378, nicknamed the Brain Worm. Well, it's an anomaly only new to us. For the Foundation, SCP-378's discovery and containment dates back to the days of the American Secure Containment Initiative. The American Secure Containment Initiative could be considered a predecessor to the SCP Foundation, active for the majority of the first half of the 20th century. While most of the stories go that the ASCI, alongside several other paranormal investigation organizations, eventually came together and formed the SCP Foundation in the early 50s, the reality is a lot murkier. As we all know, it's very hard to completely kill off an organization in the anomalous world. The secrecy and decentralization practically ensures that there's always going to be some stragglers left. And in the ASCI's case, that certainly seems to be the case. SCP-378's file indicates that by 1963, the ASCI was still around and kicking, though it was definitely living on borrowed time due to the rising prominence of the SCP Foundation. The two organizations, the Growing Foundation and the Dying ASCI, attempted to keep tabs on one another throughout the decade, but the Foundation's espionage programs proved to be more intensive and thorough. For whatever reason, the Foundation was always getting the best intel, whether it was beating the ASCI to the punch on newly discovered anomalies, gaining access to otherwise classified information only available in ASCI documents of the highest security clearances, or finding ways to benefit from the organization's detriments through diplomatic meetings that always seemed to work in the Foundation's favor. It was clear that the SCP Foundation was the new hotness, and the ASCI would have a lot of catching up to do if it wanted to remain relevant in this new post-World War II mm. world. Unfortunately, we all know what happened. The majority of the ASCI was absorbed into the Foundation shortly after its formation, and the pieces that remained would fade into obscurity in the coming years. But why was the Foundation's intel so good? More funding? Better trained agents? Luck? The answer, if you're familiar with the Foundation's ways, shouldn't come as a surprise. Of course, there was always going to be more going on behind the scenes, and that's where SCP-378 comes in. SCP-378 is an arthropod, resembling an Amazonian giant centipede, specifically one in the larval stage. SCP-378 measures about 3 meters long, with a thickness of 233 kilograms, and it possesses otherwise ordinary biological features, while about as normal as an anomaly contained by the SCP Foundation can get. On the dietary side, it eats like a normal centipede, consuming primarily other insects and lichen. On the reproductive side, things are a bit different. SCP-378 reproduces asexually, meaning that it's capable of generating offspring entirely through its own biological functions, which it excretes from its backside. A newly birthed instance, designated SCP-378-A, resembles a fully grown adult Amazonian giant centipede right from birth. But dissection of these baby peds suggests that this resemblance is superficial as SCP-378-A's organ systems beyond a primitive neural network are entirely non-existent. 
These babies are essentially shell organisms, intended to be used by SCP-378, the host centipede, as remote drones. And that's how SCP-378 proves to be useful to the Foundation at large. You see, 378-A are endoparasites, meaning that they're organisms that live inside other organisms, like a tapeworm, but so, so much worse. SCP-378-A are used by SCP-378 to infect advanced primates, such as ourselves, but also a whole host of offshoots of humanity, such as the Homo ignotus, also known as SCP-655, and the Gigantopithecus sapiens, the common Sasquatch, which you might recognize as SCP-1000. SCP-378-A enters a host through an open orifice, and after infection, the entity will integrate itself with the host's nervous system through means that are poorly understood by the Foundation. This includes brain death of the host, and extending SCP-378's remote control through its offspring and into the host itself. Vital functions and sensory input remain unaffected, meaning that the host still retains some semblance of life function, just, you know, without a brain or anything. They're not there, they're just puppets, but you'll never be able to tell. When you think of someone being puppeted by an anomalous parasite, you'd probably expect them to act a little weird. Maybe they don't speak right, or maybe they start slithering on the floor or eating only small lizards. But that's not the case with victims of SCP-378. No. Once its offspring have infected a suitable host, SCP-378 will actually do a pretty decent job of integrating its victims back into their respective social sphere. This means maintaining all of their previous relationships as best as possible, such as keeping their jobs and otherwise fitting in and not standing above the crowd. You'd probably assume they prefer to keep a low profile, mainly infecting hosts in small towns and sleepy suburbs, but you'd be wrong there too. SCP-378 loves the big city, places with high population density, and a robust entertainment scene. We'll explain later, but SCP-378 differs from ordinary insects in that its based instinct isn't to just infect and reproduce, it's to have fun, and the way it entertains itself is by living the lives of people who otherwise live busy, engaging lives, filled with plenty of social interactivity and places to go. The Foundation has yet to discover the upper limit of SCP-378, as the centipede has managed to infect quite a number of hosts with its offspring, which it all seems to maintain simultaneously without issue. Upon interrogation of a host, SCP-378 confesses to the existence of 26 human hosts, two instances of Guatemalan black howler monkeys, and three instances of SCP-1000. Considering the complex social hierarchies of monkeys, it's unsurprising that SCP-378 infected a few of them just to try them out, on top of infecting a few Sasquatches in the form of SCP-1000 which SCP-378 conveniently is immune to the inherent anomalous effects of. But there is no question as to which species SCP-378 prefers. In fact, those other things it infected, according to the host, were only acquired during periods of heavy intoxication. See, the centipede enjoys getting a little tipsy too. You can't have that in the Amazon rainforest. As humanity is the dominant species on Earth, we're the ones with the shiniest toys for SCP-378 to play with. The most exciting lives, filled with more pointless interaction and labor than a bug would know what to do with. And that's what makes SCP-378 so intriguing for the Foundation. It's an intelligent parasite, whose only motivation is to keep society running as normal so it can slip behind a few pairs of human eyes and see what it's like in the world it would never get to otherwise live in. Some of you are already thinking it, but SCP-378 is the perfect anomaly for the Foundation to use against its foes and adversaries. And as we covered earlier, in the 1960s, the Foundation had a lot to prove, mainly against the American Secure Containment Initiative. The Foundation knew to classify SCP-378 as a Thaumiel-class object. It was promptly contained in an underground terrarium filled with plenty of juicy lichen and ants for SCP-378 to feed on. Of course, there was also a decontamination chamber constructed adjacent to the regular containment chamber. Any personnel who would go in would obviously be at risk to an infection from SCP-378, and were sure that living the crazy, exciting life of a Foundation agent would have satisfied the sociable bug. 
but the SCP Foundation wasn't taking any risks. As a result, anyone entering the chamber would have to wear full body protection, and if they were found to be infected during the decontamination process, they would be terminated. After discovery of SCP-378, the Foundation immediately saw the potential in utilizing the anomaly for espionage purposes. After all, it would be a perfect spy network, capable of fitting in and maintaining ordinary roles while also communicating with SCP-378, who would feed information to the Foundation through another host. The impeccable precision of SCP-378's maintenance of its host's social personas would make the entity almost impenetrable to sniff out in the field, even for trained agents who deal with the anomalous. SCP-378's initial psychological evaluation was performed by the well-known Foundation psychologist, Dr. Simon Glass. Dr. Glass found that SCP-378 was obviously unique among arthropods, and possessed either human level of sapience, or at the very least, the ability to emulate its host's intellectual faculties. Regardless, the anomaly was intelligent, but a point of interest for Dr. Glass was SCP-378's relationship with its hosts. It maintained a constant, consistent sense of identity across multiple hosts. But interviews with SCP-378 revealed that it was fully aware that it was not those hosts in actuality. SCP-378 was essentially role-playing various human identities. It wasn't just easy for the Foundation to figure out that the Centipede enjoyed masquerading as its hosts. It pretty much spelled it out with giant letters. SCP-378's hosts rarely interact with or send information directly back to SCP-378 or fellow hosts because SCP-378 is in full control at all times. This is literally just a game for SCP-378, a source of entertainment. And if one of those hosts came under duress or was at risk of being found out by those in its life, 378 could easily abandon the host persona, which it had no issues in doing. Dr. Glass found that the host behavior was largely unique to each instance, and extroverted personalities were a favorite for SCP-378. Hosts rarely isolate themselves, except to sleep or use the bathroom, and SCP-378 appeared to take equal enthusiasm in both stressful and pleasant situations. After all, this was all a big role-playing session for it. SCP-378 appreciated some excitement in the lives of its subjects. In a way, this was like an infinite source of entertainment. You could live as many lives as you wanted at once, have almost no attachment to any consequences, because you're a bug who has no stake in the real world, and you get to experience things no other member of your species ever has or ever will. SCP-378 really is living the dream. Even to another human, this sounds pretty fun. We only get one life to live. SCP-378 gets to live as many as it wants. But Dr. Glass found another interesting fact about SCP-378. It was attached to a certain identity. Lisa Martin, a 33-year-old Mexican-American female employee at Digiana Tono's Pies, a pizza chain located in Staten Island, New York. Dr. Glass was a bit unsure as to why SCP-378 enjoyed Miss Martin so much, but it was clear from the way it talked about her that this was its favorite persona. And Dr. Glass could see why the more he studied Martin's routine. It was the perfect mixture of business, idleness, routine labor, and general engagement for SCP-378 to experience. Lisa Martin's routine was static. On every day except Saturday, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., Lisa Martin would show up to work at Digiana Tono's Pies. After she finished work, from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m., Martin would engage in maintenance of one of 17 rooftop gardens across New York City. Of these gardens, Glass discovered that 13 are maintained by volunteer organizations, 12 of which Martin was not a part of. On Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m., Martin alternated between socializing with a collection of friends and co-workers and playing piano for various high-end bars. On all days from 11 p.m. to 12 a.m., Martin would shower and then prepare for bed. She would sleep from 12 a.m. to 7 a.m., and in the morning she'd get back up and do it all over again. When you see a person's schedule laid out like this, everything seems a bit more routine and less exciting, huh? It's not an exciting life laid out on paper, but SCP-378 loved it, for whatever reasons. Attempts to interrupt Lisa Martin's routine were unilaterally met with unusual levels of hostility from the bug and its hosts, and in the event of Lisa Martin's death, SCP-378 would happily direct another host to assume her identity. 
yeah, we're, we're not sure either. Regardless, 378 had a hobby, many hobbies, but Lisa Martin was special. Dr. Glass's evaluation proved to be popular with the upper ranks of the Foundation, who due to SCP-378's intelligence and awareness of human sentience, could prove to be useful to the overall mission of the Foundation. As we said before, in 1963, the Foundation had to contend with a number of powerful adjacent organizations, the Global Occult Coalition, with their destructive tendencies and the backing of the world governments, GRU Division P, the Soviet Union's anomalous research military unit, the remnants of the American Secure Containment Initiative, who, while not as prominent or as powerful as they used to be, still remained an organization capable of deterring the Foundation. As a result, the Foundation looked into applying SCP-378 through practical means. Dr. Glass's work importance could not be understated, but the prevailing theory was that SCP-378 did not understand the significance of social dynamics in regards to hierarchy and social capital. This could be observed in its strange defense of Lisa Martin. Several of SCP-378's hosts held positions of power, two of which, David Lockheed and Alfonso Leos, were even employed by anomalous organizations and beyond the reach of the Foundation's then capacity to contain. Even holding these powerful positions, SCP-378 displayed a willingness to sacrifice the hosts to defend, replace, or otherwise maintain Lisa Martin, its favorite host. It was here when the Foundation saw an opportunity. If they could use SCP-378's favoritism of Martin to get it to do what they wanted, their dream spy network had a chance of manifesting into reality. David Lockheed, one of SCP-378's hosts, was a low-level employee of the ASCI. But if the Foundation was able to persuade SCP-378, using Martin's safety as collateral, Lockheed could rise through the ranks of the organization into a position where the Foundation needed a puppet. Second, they realized that Martin herself could prove to be a useful asset. The Foundation was always looking for new ways to conduct reconnaissance, and pizza parlors were an ideal meeting spot and espionage center, if they could be kept from the public eye. Martin's place of employment would soon be converted from your average Staten Island pizza parlor to one of the Foundation's very own spicy crust pizza chains. See what they did there? Spicy Crust Pizza? SCP? <laughs> they are so clever. Regardless, the use of SCP-378's anomalous abilities to defend Foundation operatives in the United States seemed like a useful prospect, and the idea was put to a vote by the Overseer Council. It passed, with only minor detration, under the name of the Kraken Protocol. As a result, SCP-378's containment procedures were updated, and containment of the anomaly would be focused on three primary components. Its first host, SCP-378-1, was held in the Area 19 barracks of the SCP Foundation. Dash-1 was employed as a maintenance technician with a low security clearance, and in the case of death, a brain-dead or comatose reserve personnel would be elected to replace it. SCP-378-1 served as the Foundation's primary means of communication with SCP-378. After all, they needed a channel to speak directly to the bug in charge, and Dash-1 was their way of doing so. SCP-378-2 was David Lockheed, an average employee of the American Secure Containment Initiative, working in their clerical sector. Lockheed was tasked with sabotaging ASCI operations for the Foundation, as well as collecting information in the Foundation's interests. SCP-378-2 was a little more difficult to replace than the average SCP-378 host, and was required to follow a strict health and exercise regimen. If something were to happen to Lockheed, there's no telling if the Foundation would be able to replace him, and the chances of that happening were low. Lockheed was the perfect spy, with an established rapport with the ASCI going back at least a decade, and access to information the Foundation would use to outsmart the initiative at every turn. It shouldn't come as a surprise to you that the ASCI's days were numbered, and eventually, they closed their doors entirely. SCP-378-3 was Lisa Martin, who worked at Spicy Crust Pizza in Staten Island. Martin's purpose was to maintain a network for Foundation operatives in New York and host a place where they could congregate and meet without issue. On top of that, Martin was still SCP-378's favorite persona, and the entire operation hinged on SCP-378 having Martin available to it. As a result, Lisa Martin would have to be replaced as soon as possible if anything were to happen to her. 
And with that, the Kraken Protocol was in place. Each instant formed a part of the Foundation's information gathering campaign, and was outfitted with a tracking device and an audio recorder. Every week, embedded agents stationed near each host were to evaluate the health and integrity of them, and the equipment they had inside them. If this initial rollout was a success, the Foundation would continue to use SCP-378-A in further infiltration of its enemies. But the Foundation would have to see how things played out first. Less than two years later, Lockheed had retrieved significant information for the Foundation, and the Kraken Protocol proved to be a success. A new site, Site-56, located near prominent anomalous locations, was about to be constructed. SCP-378 seemed excited at the prospects of a change in scenery and more hosts to infiltrate, but there was also something the Foundation could never have expected. In an attempt to gain a new host for SCP-378 to control, the Foundation came across something disturbing. Their target was an agent of the FBI's Unusual Incident Unit. After drugging him and bringing him back to the Foundation in order to receive an SCP-378-A instance inside him, SCP-378 informed the Foundation that it couldn't establish a connection with the agent. The personnel were confused. The agent was still alive, and 378 never had any difficulty in connecting with hosts before. They did a number of tests on the agent and tried to figure out what went wrong. That's when the Foundation discovered that there was a different centipede inside the agent's head, where the SCP-378-A instance would typically be. It looked like the Foundation had a much bigger issue on their hand than they ever had realized. The year was 1861. Arthur Duplessis, one of the world's most renowned explorers and adventurers, hacked through the thick vines of the Amazon rainforest with a well-worn machete. He grunted and strained, his clothes heavy and skin slick with sweat. He took a deep swig from his canteen and paused briefly to breathe. This was the second week of his solo expedition into the lung of the world, and the process had been grueling. He'd fought off piranhas, electric eels, and invasive kangaroo fish while wading and kayaking down the Amazon River. He'd contended with tribesmen and poachers, and narrowly dodged his fair share of poisonous beasties that could take down prey three times their size. No sane man would brave this horror for its own sake, but Arthur has as good a reason as any. He was searching for his younger brother, Joseph Duplessis, who had disappeared a month earlier during a trek through the Amazon. Joseph had always admired his brother's wild adventures and sought to imitate him. It was for that very reason that Arthur had felt responsible for his brother's current predicament and made it his mission to rescue him. The Amazon is an ancient and cruel mistress. The arrogant and foolish have hoped to conquer or tame her for centuries, but countless men had disappeared in the pulsing heart of this green behemoth. Arthur may have been a world-class explorer, in a different league to many of the others whose lives this green inferno has handedly taken, but there were creatures lurking deep in the Amazon that went beyond even Arthur's knowledge. The kind of beasts that would make the darkest and most twisted nightmares look comparatively inviting. Beasts like SCP-2031. If Joseph was able to send Arthur one more message before it all came to a horrible end, we could only imagine it'd be something like, Don't come for me. It's already too late. But there's still time to save yourself, brother. Stay away, for God's sake, stay away. You have no idea what you're dealing with here. Forget about me. Go, while there's still time. Sadly for Arthur Duplessis, that time was about to run out. He ventured further into the depths of the Amazon, where even light was scarce under the thick canopy above. A mighty green anaconda slithered through a nearby tributary, tongue flailing in search of prey. An Amazonian giant centipede, a centipede so large and vicious it preys on snakes and bats, skittered up a nearby tree on 46 needle-like legs. A big, meaty tarantula deftly navigated the branches above, while tree frogs with poison potent enough to put an entire army six feet under hopped through the rich undergrowth. Humans held no power here. Arthur fell to his knees and began to weep. His foolish ambitions had gotten his dear brother killed in this awful place. Shot to death by poachers, strangled by anacondas, or eaten alive by vicious bull sharks in the Amazon River. There were so many horrible ways that Joseph could had died, and in the absence of ever finding a body, 
all of them would simultaneously be true. The Duplessis family would never know peace. There would be a void and emptiness in all of their hearts forever. But just when Arthur was about to give up hope, something miraculous happened. He saw a human figure stumbling around faintly in the distance. Arthur drew his trusty pistol, assuming it could be a poacher or a hostile tribesman. But something was different. The figure had its back to Arthur, but he recognized its shirt, a distinctive shade of light blue, just like the shirt that Arthur had bought for Joseph on his previous birthday. Could it be? Was it really him? Arthur holstered his weapon and jumped to his feet. He couldn't let this figure get away, even if there was only the tiniest chance it could actually be his brother and not some kind of forest mirage. Arthur ran towards the figure with the last of his energy reserves, panting and wheezing. He called his brother's name again and again, but the figure didn't respond. It just stumbled along, as though drunk. But the closer Arthur got, the more certain he was that this was indeed his brother. The height, the hair, the clothes, the build. It was Joseph Duplessis, but why wasn't he responding? Why wouldn't he turn around? As Arthur finally reached the figure, he ground to a halt. The most profound sense of dread fell over him like a sudden monsoon. Something unnatural, something truly terrible was about to happen, but he didn't know what. And moreover, it was too late to stop now. Feeling anxiety prickling up his legs and back, Arthur reached forward to grab his brother by the shoulder, the word Joseph trembling on his lips. When Arthur's hand touched Joseph's shoulder, he felt a fear greater than anything he'd experienced before. Something was moving beneath the skin of Joseph's shoulder, something writhing and alive. A million tiny creatures all working together in his brother's flesh. Before he could even draw his hand away, his brother turned. Or rather, the creatures that were wearing his brother's body turned around. Arthur couldn't help but scream at the horrible sight before him. His brother's face looked loose and rotten, aging skin hanging off a rotting skull. His jaw hung loose, no tongue inside, no eyes either. Just millions of ants swarming in and out of Joseph Duplessis's vacant dead face. The ants were huge and spiny, with long curved mandibles. Ection bruschelli, a particularly hardy species of New World Army Ant. Arthur stepped back, babbling in terror at what had become of his brother. The Joseph suit stepped forward towards him, and almost instinctively, Arthur pushed him with both hands, feeling the nightmarish activity swarming beneath the loose cover of Joseph's bony chest. The Joseph suits tumbled backward, tripping over a rock and burst. There were no organs left inside his brother now. They'd been eaten long ago. It was just a thin tarpaulin of gray skin over dry bones, and of course, millions upon millions of ants. Now making a beeline for Arthur with the frightening military precision any naturalist could expect from Ecaton Burchelli. But while army ants could be a formidable and frightening foe in their own right, nobody had seen any ants like this before. Well, nobody who'd lived to tell the tale, at least. Arthur turned to flee, but sadly, it was already too late for him. What he thought were mere prickles of anxiety were actually an invasion force of Ecton Burchelli soldiers, which had positioned themselves over key nerves and ligaments on his skin and spine. As Arthur tried to run away, the ants began to bite into him, cutting through skin, rending bone and munching into the chewy neurons underneath. Arthur felt intense flashes of pain all over his body before collapsing to the ground paralyzed. That's when the true horrors began. If there was one consolation for Arthur in this last terrible hours of his life, he would at least know firsthand exactly how his brother died. He couldn't move, but he could feel everything. The creatures chewed through the flesh of his extremities, cutting holes in his skin and creating openings for swarms of their insect brethren to enter through. Arthur felt like he was on fire as the swarm entered his body, but was unable to do anything about it. Death by these creatures is a slow and torturous experience. Unlike their non-anomalous counterparts, the swarms don't immediately start devouring all available soft tissue. SCP-2031 wants to keep their prey alive while they renovate their new home. Arthur finally died two days later, from dehydration. 
It was at this point that the creatures finally began eating his organs and eventually distributing their colony throughout his body. The ants even produce an enzyme that slows the decaying process for their deceased hosts. That's why Joseph Duplessis didn't look a whole lot worse by the time Arthur found him, even though he'd already suffered a month of post-mortem infestation. Not long after Arthur's death, the Arthur suit got up and walked away. The world would never know how or why Arthur Duplessis and his brother disappeared in the dark heart of the Amazon jungle, but perhaps for the sake of all those who loved them, ignorance is actually kinder than the truth. It would be almost a century before the Foundation finally discovered these creatures on a nearby farm, designated them SCP-2031, and began containment and testing. They soon became aware of what Arthur, Joseph, and many others had learned the hard way. While they may be relatively ineffectual individually, together these insects were a real force to be reckoned with. Very few non-anomalous animals had any chance of escaping them once they'd set their sights on a target and began assuming their attack positions. In one observed instance, SCP-2031 soldiers were able to take down a 1,000-kilogram Angus bull in five minutes, most of which was just spent getting their soldiers into their proper positions over the spine and leg ligaments. The Foundation just got extremely lucky that these vicious insect predators happened to be isolated to some pretty specific areas in South America thanks to the climate requirements of their habitats. In fact, pretty much all of the specimens the Foundation found were all in one place. The creatures had developed a particularly frightening form of ant farm known as SCP-2031-A, an isolated containment zone on a stretch of farmland where the ants could find hosts in the form of live people and animals, keeping them relatively isolated. 27 separate SCP-2031 colonies were first found on this farm, inhabiting and operating 27 different corpses. These include 15 cows, 5 different horses, 3 domestic pigs, 1 dog, and most fascinating of all, 3 human specimens, an adult male, an adult female, and a child of unspecified gender. What's even more fascinating than the efficacy of these ants in attacking all different kinds of prey is their deftness at mimicking the behavior of their hosts. This isn't a reconstructive maggot situation. See our video on that nightmare for further information. The ants attempt to make their hosts actually act like the creatures they once were. The Foundation were astonished to see that the three human suits seem to actually go through the motions of running the farm, watering the livestock, dispensing feed, moving other SCP-2031 colonies from one pasture to another. The human child suit would even spend extensive time playing with the dog suit, engaging in games such as fetch or mock wrestling. How the SCP-2031 colonies are able to do this is unknown. Working theories include rigorous observation of their targets before colonization, and the colony hive mind somehow picking up residual thoughts or muscle memory from their victims. Non-anomalous ants introduced to the SCP-2031 colonies also begin exhibiting anomalous traits, so the effects may somehow be contagious. One of the most fascinating moments of all came when the structural integrity of the dog suit finally gave out, leading to its colony exiting the body and returning to more nomadic behavior typical of army ants in search of a new host. The strange part was that the human suits actually seemed to grieve for the deceased dog suit, with the child suit becoming somewhat distressed that their playmate was suddenly gone. The two human suits even took the carcass of the dog suit and buried it in another pasture. It was unlike anything the Foundation had observed with SCP-2031 before. At what point did mimicry become sincere behavior? because now SCP-2031 was seriously blurring the lines. It is in the best interest of the Foundation to keep this little ant farm going, both to keep SCP-2031 distracted from venturing further and causing trouble, and to further study the fascinating behaviors and dynamics exhibited by SCP-2031 colonies in captivity. One of the researchers has already put in a request for a new golden retriever. Take a brief moment to think back to your younger years spending long, tiresome hours trapped in a classroom, waiting to hear the noise of that final bell of the day. That sound meant freedom, the end of another grueling six hours at your desk, and the chance to get back to the warm sanctuary of home. If you were lucky, you might not have had to go far to get back to the safety and security of being in your parents' house. Living close enough to the school would mean you could easily walk home when the day was through. 
But your classmates? Well, they weren't all as lucky. Some of them had miles to travel, all the way across town even. Fortunately, though, the school bus would always be waiting outside at the end of each day, ready to take a gaggle of rowdy kids back home. And if you were one of those kids that had to take the bus, you'll know that the trip home after school was hardly a calm drive. Paper planes and spitballs firing from all directions, wads of chewing gum stuck to the undersides of seats, other kids all around you screaming and yelling at the top of their lungs. Still, it could be worse, right? No, trust us, it could be much, much worse than you can ever imagine. What if one day, the bus that picked you up from school wasn't a bus at all? What if instead, it was SCP-2086? Picture this, one day you get put in detention at school. Maybe you were disrupting a class or were caught spraying graffiti on the outside wall of the gym. Whatever the reason, we're sure you'll think it is unfair that you got held back after school, after everyone else had already gone home. But you do your time until finally you're told you can leave. Problem is, your house is on the other side of town, and you've already missed the bus. You make your way off the campus, down the nearest street. Maybe there's a city bus you can catch that'll get you back home. As you stroll away from your school, you realize that the nearest bus stop, the first one on the route home, seems to be further away than you remember it being. Must be just the exhaustion of a long day getting the better of you, playing tricks on your mind. It's not like someone could move the bus stop, right? Finally reaching the stop, you notice lights coming down the street after a few moments of waiting quietly. A late bus, just like you hoped for. It pulls up to the next stop, the doors folding open to allow you on board. It's totally empty, save for the driver, but straight away you notice there's something odd about him. He seems drained of color, his movements are weird, more like a puppet on strings than an actual living, breathing human being. Now that you think about it, if it wasn't for the fact he was clearly moving, driving the bus, you might assume that he was a corpse. Then again, maybe he just had a long day too. Taking a seat, you try not to think about it and stare out of the window in boredom. You watch as the route takes you past stop after stop, all of them empty just like the bus itself. But then something unexpected happens. You've ridden the bus to and from school so many times before that you can't help but notice when, for some reason, it takes a wrong turn. Looking out the window, you know you aren't mistaken. The driver has changed direction. Instead of heading towards the nearest stop to home, he's taken the bus towards the furthest edge of town. Desperately, you try yelling at him, asking why he's taken the wrong turn, but the driver stays still, as if he can't even hear what you're saying. That's when you notice the smell. You didn't catch it before, but now it's all around you, filling the air inside the bus. It's almost like the scent of disinfectant. The bus now smells the same way a hospital does, but that's not all. The more you breathe it in, the more you feel yourself starting to get woozy, arms and legs getting heavier. Everything around you feels as if it's spinning uncontrollably. Out of the windows, you can just about make out the sight of a junkyard, blurring in and out of focus. It's meant to be abandoned, and yet you're sure you can see movement, massive, indeterminate shapes shifting around in the dark. Finally, your vision goes dark and you fall unconscious onto the floor of the bus. Only, you were never on the bus to begin with. No, although you didn't know it, you were prey to something that just looked like a bus. SCP-2086. And now that it's caught you, you'll never see the light of day again. Now, SCP-2086 doesn't just refer to a single creature, not by a long shot. It is the designation given to an entire species of arthropods. Think lobsters, crabs, and spiders, or insects like centipedes and millipedes, only much bigger. To the untrained eye, and depending on when you look, an instance of SCP-2086 will normally look like any ordinary public transport vehicle, of any make and model, or belonging to any company or transit authority. Usually, though, they look like regular old buses, at least while they're out foraging for food. When born, an SCP-2086 specimen will grow to full juvenile size within a week, usually weighing 200 kilograms or less. Full matured adult instances, however, can weigh approximately 17,000 kilograms. The adults are the ones that go out foraging, leaving the nest to collect food to then bring back to the juvenile SCP-2086s. And by food, we of course mean humans. 
While out on the roads, matured SCP-2086 creatures are practically identical to the auto vehicles that form their bodies. But the materials that this disguise is made from, the steel, plastic, wood, and glass, they're all actually comprised of specialized chitin, the kind of outer shell you'd find on most arthropods. But underneath that outer shell, that's where you'll find the real horror. Within the main chamber, beneath the flooring of the bus's long inner portion, is stored the pulsing, beating heart of an SCP-2086 specimen. And we don't mean that in a metaphorical sense. If you were to lift up the floorboards of one of these bus-like creatures, you'd see its heart, along with other vital organs like the creature's brain and stomach. What's more, the figure in the front seat that you thought was a living, breathing bus driver actually isn't living or breathing, not anymore. Preserved in a shell-like substance that the creature is able to produce, the driver is actually a human corpse, acting as a decoy for SCP-2086s. From within the bus body, fibrous appendages reach up into the corpse, almost like incredibly thin hairs. The creature can then use the cadaver essentially as a puppet, a puppet with a dead person's body. That's how an SCP-2086 is able to move its driver around, making it appear more lifelike so it can lure its prey aboard. Think of it like the bioluminescent light that an anglerfish uses to tempt unsuspecting fish into their jaws. Same principle, but with a dramatically different result when it comes to SCP-2086. But if you thought bus creatures with internal organs under the floor and dead meat puppets in the driver's seat weren't creepy enough, there's still much more to SCP-2086s than meets the eye. For example, when they aren't out foraging, the adult creatures can unravel the roof of their bus-shaped outer shell. Underneath is a pair of wings, large enough and strong enough to carry their entire 7,000 kilos of weight off the ground and up into the air. As for eyes, the headlights at the front are, in actual fact, bioluminescent optical organs, allowing the creatures to see their prey even in the dark. Still not horrifying enough? Well, would knowing about their legs help? The wheels underneath an SCP-2086 specimen are also capable of unraveling, forming long gray or black legs like those of a spider. Yes, these are bus creatures with wings and multi-jointed legs. These legs aren't just big, clumsy appendages either. Compared with other arthropods, SCP-2086s are able to use their limbs to perform surprisingly intricate actions and finer levels of manipulations. For instance, a number of specimens have been observed in the wild by the SCP Foundation building shelters out of any materials that they can find near their nesting ground. And where do they normally nest? Wherever there's plenty of scrap metal and hardly any people to notice them. Junkyards are the preferred habitats of SCP-2086s and where they will normally establish their colonies. While the juveniles remain within the confines of the colony, adult SCP-2086 specimens will leave to collect humans. Although on occasion, the younger specimens have been known to travel out from their nest and rearrange or relocate signposts for bus stops. They then place them in a route that leads them back towards their nesting ground. It's something worth remembering if your nearest bus stop ever seems to be a little further away from the school than usual. Afterward, the older specimens will travel along the route laid out by the juvenile SCP-2086s, picking up any human passengers that they find waiting at the relocated bus stops. They have to choose their moments wisely, with people boarding and disembarking from the bus usually every few stops. Once an SCP-2086 has as many humans on board as it can carry, with the certainty it won't lose any at the upcoming stop, it secretes a substance similar to chloroform. This fills the inner chamber of the bus, causing that noxious smell, like hospital disinfectant. The chloroform-like substance incapacitates all the passengers on board, rendering them unconscious and readying them to be taken back to the local SCP-2086 colony. Once the adult SCP-2086 has arrived at the junkyard, the juveniles will descend on it, Given their much, much smaller size, they will climb inside the mature specimen and forcibly remove each and every human passenger it is carrying within. Then comes the truly nasty part, feeding time. Each juvenile SCP-2086 will force their captive human through an orifice that is located under the front hood of their vehicle's shell. This sphincter, a circular formation of muscle that can expand and contract to perform a bodily function, is connected to where the steering wheel is found on an adult SCP-2086. The younger creatures will push their human prey through the sphincter, 
consuming them. Once this has occurred, those hairy appendages in the driver's seat will then latch onto the body of the now-dead human, piercing through their skin, winding up and around their bones. These are the same fibrous hairs used to puppet the deceased corpse and use it to lure others aboard the bus. But these appendages have another function. They're feeding tubes. They will drain every last drop of blood from the SCP-2086's prey until the body is little more than a husk. At which point, the tubes inject a saline solution directly into the cadaver. Afterwards, the inside of the bus fills with that same substance that preserves the corpse, and the process is complete. As horrifying as these creatures are, one of the few upsides of SCP-2086's is that they don't live very long. Female specimens will reproduce after 8 days and produce 20 offspring after this point. Each of these newborns reaches full maturity and size in about a week. On average, SCP-2086s live for 12 to 15 days. Another net positive is, because of their short lifespans, an SCP-2086 specimen doesn't need to feed on a human more than once, as the nutrients it absorbs as a juvenile are enough to sustain it through adulthood. Once it has matured, an SCP-2086 will go out into the nearest city or town to forage for humans, providing food to the next generation. And so the cycle continues. In the future, rather than taking the bus, maybe it's safer to walk. It might mean the difference between you making it home or becoming food. Now and again, you might stumble across an entry in the SCP Foundation archive that is far more than meets the eye. As you are probably already aware, sometimes the Foundation's numerical SCP designations can be referencing an entity, a creature, an object, a location, or even a combination of linked anomalies all sharing a version of the same number. Such is partially the case with SCP-4812. In this instance, the designation number 4812 doesn't refer to one singular item or entity. Instead, it is more of a collective designation, an umbrella term for three distinct, separate, but connected anomalies. We've got a lot of ground to cover here, so without further ado, let's take a look at SCP-4812, better known collectively as Wrath. We'll begin in a cavern deep beneath Alais in the south of France where we find the first of the entities to share the designation SCP-4812. This creature, large and without its own distinct form, is referred to as SCP-4812-S. It possesses a number of long appendages that protrude from its amorphous body, each one covered in a sticky adhesive, a sort of glue-like substance. In addition, each appendage as well as the rest of SCP-4812-S's body is covered in fine hair that is also hydrophobic, meaning that it does not absorb water and in fact actively repels it. These tendrils extend deep into the walls of the cavern surrounding the creature. SCP-4812-S also has an inherent latent ability to affect anyone that visually perceives it. In other words, look upon this creature at your own peril. And we don't mean that looking at it will drive you mad. The fact is that nobody has been able to look directly at this creature without suffering a horrific, grisly death. Upon taking even the quickest glimpse of SCP-4812-S, the person observing will suffer the same effect they would if their eyes, brain, and entire nervous system had been dipped in caustic acid. Yes, this creature instantly melts down on a molecular level anyone who is brave enough or foolish enough to directly look at it. That means a pain unlike any you could imagine. Bleeding through the skin and all orifices, paralysis, asphyxiation, and then death in that order. Humans cannot directly interact with the creature unless it is submerged in total darkness, where they cannot perceive it visually. The anomalous hazard of this entity even extends to photos or video recordings of SCP-4812-S. However, the effect is not as immediate or violent when someone just looks at an image or video of it. Still, you might want to check that your brain isn't melting after this video is over, just to be safe. Beyond killing anyone that sees it, SCP-4812-S does very little, staying quite still in its cave behind the maximum security doors the Foundation has put in place at the entrance. So that's our first of the SCP-4812s. Who's next? How about SCP-4812-E, an approximately 15 meter tall humanoid made of platinum? 
This entity appears vaguely skeletal, with traces of tungsten and other metal compounds in its composition. SCP-4812-E remains at a constant body temperature of 0 0.000000031 Kelvin, or almost negative 460 degrees Fahrenheit. However, this entity can also absorb the heat around it without changing its own temperature, reducing our cell at room temperature to absolute zero in around 16 seconds flat. And it's because of this that SCP-4812-E is often surrounded by a layer of frozen air and water. Much like the other creature it shares a designation with, close interactions with SCP-4812-E are often deadly. Stand too close and the air around you would drop in temperature rapidly. The water within your body would freeze, and in seconds, you would die. Even with the use of a specially insulated suit, you would be lucky to gain a few short moments of added protection. The only thing that weakens SCP-4812-E's effect is to expose it to extreme heat, although this does not stop the temperature absorption entirely, just slows it. But it's through the constant application of high temperatures that the Foundation has been able to keep SCP-4812-E contained in a thermally controlled vault kept intensely hot at all times. Finally, we have the last of the three, designated as SCP-4812-K, and we recommend anyone with a bug phobia to look away now. This creature is an enormous winged insect, almost like a cross between a stag beetle and a scorpion in some of the physical traits it shares with them. While its size might be significantly bigger, measuring 180 meters long, the insect possesses two large pinchers, four legs, four wings that extend from its back, and a long, segmented tail with a pointed barb at the tip. Yes, this creepy crawly would need a lot more than just a can of Raid to get rid of it. But perhaps most strangely of all is SCP-4812-K's face. Not the typical insect eyes and mouth you would expect, but the face of a human male. Much like its cavern-dwelling counterpart, SCP-4812-K tends to not do all that much when left alone. It can usually be found flying through the upper stratosphere, only really moving when it flaps its wings. You might have a hard time trying to spot it, though, as its body is coated in reflected chitin. In other words, the bug's exoskeleton refracts light away from it and makes it almost invisible. While the SCP Foundation has made attempts to secure and contain this gigantic flying insect after they learned of its existence, the creature's sheer size and strength have destroyed any fighter jets or drones they have sent after it. It seems impervious to damage from conventional weapons, with anything fired at it being almost perfect reflected and directed back towards the shooter. All the Foundation can really do is hope that nobody else spots it and keeps a close eye on SCP-4812-K through regular surveillance. Above all, though, one procedure remains consistent and all of the utmost importance with every aspect of SCP-4812. Never, under any circumstances, can any of them be allowed to interact with the other two. So what could possibly connect these three creatures? An amorphous entity that kills anyone who looks at it. A giant humanoid male made of platinum that alters temperature without absorbing heat. And a winged insect that is almost perfect at reflecting anything around it. They all seem to be pretty disconnected. Yet, their common thread must be pretty significant for all three to share the title of SCP-4812. Indeed, if they had no relation to each other, they could each have their own unique number. And what is the mysterious fourth redacted entity that is also referred to as SCP-4812? The answers to this multitude of questions aren't exactly straightforward. Still, there does exist a series of anomalous documents and items that the Foundation has recovered that feature some of the necessary information. Recovered from Marcus de Wies, a Dutch collector of anomalous artifacts, these items are referred to as the Connington Set, named after Winston J. Connington, an English archaeologist and occultist whose research led the Foundation to the discovery of a number of SCPs. Among the various artifacts of the Connington Set is a journal kept by Connington himself, featuring depictions of the different SCP-4812 creatures and notes recording his findings. The set also features three hefty tomes written in German over the course of many years that contain multiple archaic coordinates. In one, an addition in Italian by another author seems to shed a little light on SCP-4812. The translation of this section tells of an ancient kingdom, respected above all others. 
known either as the House of Apollyon or the Sky Kings of Old Europe. The first ruler of this kingdom was allegedly a descendant of the King of Crimson Skies, or Asem, the first man. These Sky Kings ruled over what is now modern-day Europe for a hundred generations, conquering all who opposed them. Among their adversaries were those faithful to the Iron God, presumably the Mechanites the ancient machine-worshipping religion that preceded the Church of the Broken God. Eventually, however, complacency reared its ugly head, and Sky King Ceres VIII von Apollyon looked beyond the realms of men, hoping to find new land to conquer. Sarius VIII assembled his forces, the largest army ever seen, and set his sights on the lands of the Fair Folk, more commonly known as fairies nowadays. These fair folk were already engaged in conflict with their southern neighbors, the Children of the Moon, and were drastically underprepared for Saurus's approaching forces. Within two weeks, the fairies were scattered, driven from their lands. There was, however, a sole survivor, a fey princess, who was captured and faced the grim fate of being taken as a trophy. But the princess had other plans. While being taken back to the Sky King's domain, she cast a curse upon the House of Apollyon, and Sarus the Eighth in particular. A horrific storm swept the returning ships as the Fey Princess prayed to an ancient, nameless god for vengeance against her people's conquerors. According to legend, the chains that had her shackled to Sarus's ship caught fire, and the blaze spread until it had burned the Sky King's ship to ash. It has even been said that the same chains then wrapped around Sarus himself, dragging him down into the ocean's depths. Then, to defend against any further dark magic from the remaining fair folk, Ceres IX appointed four kings to defend his kingdom. By now, you might still be wondering what any of this has to do with SCP-4812. But don't worry, we're getting there, we promise. So as the story continues, the remaining ships were still able to bring the Fey Princess back, and she was brought before Saurus's heir, Saurus IX von Apollyon, who imprisoned her for what she had done. The princess was sent into a sealed dungeon deep beneath the oceans. This prison is heavily implied to be the first of the SCP-4812 entities, better known to us as SCP-4812-S. However, the explanations of the heat sink platinum humanoid and the reflective flying insect are a little harder to decipher from Winston J. Connington's journal. While most of Connington's notes are written in a cipher, a few sections have been translated. According to him, from her prison deep below the Earth, the voice of the fairy princess was able to communicate with the souls of the four knights protecting Saurus the Ninth's kingdom. As a result, the Sky King was forced to banish them, and this brought forth what Connington referred to as the Great Profanities. Without the knight's defense, some force known as the Vinivinex, the first profanity was able to cast its cold hand over Saurus's only daughter killing her. A creature whose presence can drain the heat from a person? Sounds an awful lot like SCP-4812-E, huh? In retaliation for his daughter's death, Ceres drew up an ancient spear called the Godless Lance and struck the being down, casting it into the Earth's molten core and subduing SCP-4812-E with the intense heat below. Another section describes the King of Many Faces, Lamenolant, the creature we know as SCP-4812-K. Connington's findings describe this entity's slaughter of the Deva, a neighboring kingdom. The enormous insect appeared from the space beyond spaces and would deflect perfectly any attack made against it before taking the faces of the Deva and returning to the skies. But there was one final profanity, known only as the Profane Dark. The legend continues with this profanity, a dark black smear rising from the graves of the fair folk. It soaked through the earth and burst from below, claiming the Sky King and dragging him into the endless void. As it pulled him away, Ceres cursed the profane dark, calling it Yash, the last great foe of man. Watching his kingdom fall without the protection of his four knights, all the Sky King could utter was one repeated word. Rah. Our disgusting tale of anomalous nastiness begins in the humble town of Beckley, West Virginia, back in the 1990s. It was 10 a.m. on a hot day in early August, as Oscar Doug was winding his way through the wooded roads and back streets of town. He isn't the villain of our story, he's just a man doing his very unglamorous job, cleaning up roadkill for the local government. 
plenty of woodland critters meet their ends against the wheels and bumpers of careless drivers. And it was thanks to the tireless work of people like Oscar Doug that the fine roads of rural America aren't piled high with carcasses. Of course, Oscar was used to seeing some unpleasant things on the job, but nothing like this. When he began pulling over to the side of the lonely street to pick up a dead deer, he was shocked to see a sudden flash of stark white illuminated by his headlights. It was a naked human woman crouched over the deer carcass. She was sucking at the exposed red flesh on the deer's flank, as though feeding off of it. Flies circled around her in the hot summer air. The smell emerging from the deer carcass was unspeakable, but the woman didn't even seem to care. She just fed away with a crazed look in her eye. And even more disturbing was the fact that he recognized her. It was Mrs. Faber, a local eccentric who lived with her husband on a farm just outside of town. Or at least, she had. You see, Oscar Doug had never met Mrs. Faber in person before. He only recognized her from the missing person flyers posted around town. He pulled out his cell phone to call the authorities, when suddenly Mrs. Faber was startled by something and fled into the woods. This would be the first of many encounters reported by townsfolk concerning Mrs. Faber, or more specifically, the anomalous species that was once Mrs. Faber and is now designated SCP-726. Mrs. Faber practically became a local cryptid, similar to that of Sasquatch or the Loch Ness Monster, with sightings of her in the woods and around town frequently being reported by the locals. Of course, Mr. Faber was beside himself about the whole situation. What was happening to his beloved wife? People assumed a psychotic break or some kind of sudden onset of acute dementia. She had to be apprehended and brought in for her own good before she caused harm to herself or others. And on August 16th, she was finally found and captured. Mrs. Faber was found in the dumpster of a local diner with a large dog. After being subdued, she was sent to a nearby hospital. Her condition had seemingly advanced to the point where she was no longer even capable of speech. However, if it had ended there, the SCP Foundation wouldn't have been called in. It would have just been a sad local story of a woman who became very unwell. But that was only the beginning to the true strangeness behind SCP-726. Random livestock, like cows and pigs, were found across the town, behaving incredibly bizarre, exhibiting actions and traits uncommon of their respective species. And the most shocking of all was that the sightings of Mrs. Faber around town still didn't stop, despite her being actively held by a local hospital. Naturally, that's when the SCP Foundation decided to take control of the situation. They dispatched field agents to properly investigate and figure out what was going on in Beckley, West Virginia. That's when they discovered a peculiar commonality. Maggots. You see, the behavior exhibited by the strange animals and by Mrs. Faber was not consistent with their own species, but they were incredibly consistent with the behaviors of the common botfly a particularly unpleasant form of fly that sometimes lays its eggs in the bodies of still-living animals. The anomalously affected entities exhibited insectoid movements, an affinity for rotting meat, and even strange shifting of the back muscles, suggesting the gesture of flapping wings that weren't there. But what was going on here? Was this mind control, or something more insidious? As it turned out, the key to unlocking this mystery was in the dumpster that Mrs. Faber was found in. An entire pig was found inside the dumpster, exhibiting the same strange behaviors as the other anomalous animals. But not long before it was transformed into a pig, it was simply a half-eaten hot dog thrown to waste in the garbage. This miraculous transformation came courtesy of SCP-726, now also known as the Reconstructive Maggots. Much like regular maggots, these creatures are attracted to decaying flesh and will multiply and consume dead bodies or rotten food rapidly. However, the truly strange thing is what happens afterward. The maggots will expel purified waste matter, which then reconstitutes back into a kind of living, exact clone of the entity it once was. Well, exact in a physical sense. In a psychological sense, these clones are exactly like a mature botfly. The maggots that reconstitute these bodies die off almost immediately, but whenever two of these clones mate, with reproductive behavior often being inspired by the presence of carcasses or spoilt meat, 
They produce more eggs, which in turn release SCP-726 maggots and begin the cycle all over again. And fascinatingly, these maggots can reconstitute an entire clone from even a portion of the original creature. Which begs the question, why were there seemingly multiple Mrs. Fabers sighted in and around the town of Beckley, West Virginia? Upon further investigation into Mrs. Faber and her husband, a terrible secret came to light. Mr. Faber had murdered his wife in a fit of rage and cut up her body before burying the pieces around the grounds of his home. Unbeknownst to him, an infestation of SCP-726 maggots across the property ate each piece and reconstituted them into individual fly-brained clones of the original. Mr. Faber was later arrested for the murder, and multiple people in the town of Beckley were given amnestic treatment to forget the strange and frightening things they'd seen. But for the Foundation, the strange and frightening things were only just beginning. An unnamed doctor with the SCP Foundation decided to conduct a series of utterly repulsive experiments on SCP-726, opening the log with the fateful words, I've decided to begin by testing the limits of repeated replication. A single SCP-726 egg will be introduced per sample. Due to their rapid multiplication, maggot volume does not affect their speed of operation, only the size of the organism to be reconstructed. The first subject was a recently deceased Norwegian rat, cut in half lengthwise. When the SCP-726 eggs were introduced, the two halves were rapidly constituted into a pair of living rats with mirrored fur patterns. Both of these rats were then ground into a fine paste and mixed. Wondering if SCP-726 would create a hybrid, they did not, instead separating the mix into two piles and once again creating two rats, nearly identical to the ones before, except for one of them now having a red right eye. The rat without the red right eye was processed into a fine paste, get used to hearing that phrase, before the introduction of more SCP-726 samples. It reproduced a close approximation of the rat it once was, aside from a slight limp and blindness in both eyes. The heart was then taken from this rat, and upon the introduction of SCP-726 into the heart, it was reconstituted without eyes or any pigmentation. A note also mentions that the creature squeaked incessantly. The heart from this rat was then taken and cut in half before SCP-726 was introduced. The result was a pair of even more severely messed up eyeless rats. One could only walk in tight circles, and the other immediately attacked the first rat. The doctor noted that both physiology and insect behavior seemed to degrade with repeated reconstitutions of the same genetic material. Next, a scrap of flesh was taken from the hairless rat. The creature that reconstituted from this was hairless, eyeless, and limbless, and didn't successfully survive for long. A liver was found inside its brain case. But because this particular researcher hadn't spit in the face of God enough for one day, the tests continued. The liver from the brainless rat was given a dose of SCP-726, and the result was an eyeless, legless, limbless creature with a long, worm-like midsection, which quickly began to devour its own posterior before dying of blood loss. This dead rat was then put through three more iterations of testing. It first became a large, formless mass of tissue, and then a long, slug-like creature that takes in nutrients through its skin. After this, no more changes were recorded, as it had presumably reached its peak performance. The scientists decided to keep this creature for long-term observation, naming it Brundle, after the scientists in David Cronenberg's remake of The Fly. At this point, the doctor began to conduct tests that, mercifully, did not involve any more rats. Instead, the Foundation moved on to humans. Dried flesh from a body that's over 2,000 years old was given to SCP-726, leading to a full reconstitution of a middle-aged man with the mind of a fly, opening doors to potential practical forensic applications of SCP-726. Humans seem to experience a similar degree of form degradation after multiple reconstitutions from the same genetic material. But due to humans being larger and more complex organisms, the changes are often less pronounced, like changes in eye color or fingerprints. While the forensic use of SCP-726 is an open door, clones produced by SCP-726 are worthless for both medical and food purposes. 
During one experiment, SCP-726 was used to replace a missing chunk of a wounded D-Class's leg. This appeared to be successful at first, until the D-Class later experienced a rapid mental devolution into a fly-like state, just like the other victims of SCP-726. The D-Class was terminated, and the test was recorded as a failure. It's believed that a similar thing would happen if organ transplants were taken out of SCP-726 clones and given to non-anomalous donors. SCP-726 was used to clone several livestock animals, such as cows and pigs. Food items like steaks were rendered from these animals, cooked and given to D-classes. Much like the transplants, this led to a similar state of devolution for those who ate the infected meat. Even when the meat was thoroughly disinfected and processed, the anomalous effects remained. So no, SCP-726 won't be ending world hunger anytime soon. Though, if it gave us all the minds of flies through tainted meat, it may at least end all global warfare, seeing as flies don't have the mental capacity to create or wield weapons. At this point, it seemed that the researcher was just curious and felt like trying some other random experiments just for the heck of it, like getting SCP-726 to reconstitute a non-anomalous botfly, leading to the clone simply being an unusually large botfly which died shortly thereafter, or testing a burger patty from a local independent drive through restaurant that reconstituted into two different cows and one large rat. Yummy. But the most horrifying result of all came when they tested SCP-726 on what was supposedly a vegan burger, made entirely out of artificial meat and plant matter. The resulting creatures were so unimaginably horrifying they literally cannot be described. Even hardened SCP Foundation researchers were driven to scream and vomit at the mere sight of them. One of these creatures was killed and ground into fine paste before SCP-726 was introduced again. Somehow, this resulted in something even worse. A truly horrifying, unkillable entity on par with SCP-682. Even when they liquefied the beast, it kept attacking. They could only stop it by freezing it and keeping it on ice. Testing into SCP-726 was suspended shortly thereafter. Ah, <sighs> maggots, spotflies, and rat paste. How lovely. If you were eating during any of this, well, you only have yourself to blame. There is a planet orbiting a G-type main sequence star. Unlike the millions of barren rocks littering the cosmos, this one is in what scientists call the Goldilocks Zone, the area around a star believed to be most capable of sustaining life. And life does more than just survive on this world. It thrives. The distant world is home to a mix of animal and plant life, including a large, technologically advanced civilization of humans. Other than the Earth, this is the most complex ecosystem the SCP Foundation is aware of, and it may be the greatest threat to life on Earth in the universe. This is SCP-3003, a Keter-class object with one of the most ominous nicknames in the entire Foundation database. The End of History Research into this world, which is located roughly 208 light-years from Earth, revealed many similarities to our own world. It is only 3% heavier than Earth, rotates in 30 hours, and orbits its sun at a similar distance to our own planet. The temperatures are similar, and they are tempered enough that the majority of the planet's landmass is able to support large numbers of life forms. While few species found on SCP-3003 are identical to those on Earth, Many are surprisingly similar, but it's three of these organisms specifically that combine to create an existential threat to our own world. SCP-3003-1 is a small beetle-like creature known as Mars by the planet's human population. While they grow to only 3 centimeters in length at most, they have a strong ability to defend themselves. In addition to their hard carapace, they can shoot a spider silk-like substance from their abdomen and coat themselves with acidic liquid which makes them impossible for predators to eat. They spend most of their time swarming and feeding on plants and can live 15 years in the wild. They're largely harmless to the planet's humans. That is, until an invisible enemy enters the picture. SCP-3003-2 is a single-celled amoeba-like creature that has evolved to be completely dependent on other beings like the Mars. In other words, it's a parasite, and SCP-3003-1 is essential to its life cycle. After it makes contact with the Mars and infects them, though, it doesn't stick around. Rather, it starts to transform the beetles into vicious parasites themselves. 
causing them to grow a long, pointed stinger on their head. This stinger can paralyze its target, allowing the Mars to inject whatever it stung with the population of SCP-3003-2 lurking inside of it. And these beetles that have been taken over only have one target. SCP-3003-3 entities are humans, 30 billion of them, to be precise. The human civilization of SCP-3003 is far larger than our own, and studies have indicated that they're genetically identical and could even produce viable offspring with the humans on Earth. And they are the primary target of the infection of SCP-3003-1 and 2. When attacked by the infected Mars, the beetle creates a hole and enters into the human's body before sealing the hole with its silk material. Once inside, it can live up to three years inside the human, during which time the human is fundamentally transformed. Once they've been infected, the SCP-3003-3 human becomes obsessed with spreading the Mars and develops a pleasure response to being in its presence. They maintain their intelligence and become hyper-rational, able to evaluate information quickly and effectively without any influence of emotions. While the capacity for emotions remains, these humans rarely express them and almost never act on them. They have one primary function, to spread the infection further. It sounds like the beginning of an alien invasion, but the invasion already happened. The war is over, and the humans of the planet orbiting HIP-56948 have lost. The infection is not growing. It's already complete. SCP-3003 has a population of 30 billion humans, and every single one is host to SCP-3003-1 parasites. This happened centuries ago, and the entire society has since been reshaped to accommodate these parasitic creatures and to make the human population more hospitable to them. While these humans are identical to those on Earth, they lack its genetic diversity. The humans of SCP-3003 have been selectively bred to make ideal hosts, complete with larger bodies, more fat tissue, higher pain tolerance, and less susceptibility to diseases. But the society has not degraded due to the infection, quite the opposite. The SCP-3003-3 population has become a hive mind of sorts, working together towards a single purpose. As such, these humans have evolved to be far more united than humans on Earth. They all speak a single language similar to Dutch, with no other languages still active. All humans belong to the same culture, and research has indicated this is about 500 years old. Before the infection, they were a humble society that had over 7,000 different cultures and mainly engaged in trading. None of them exist anymore, and they aren't the only thing that's gone. SCP-3003 lacks Earth's genetic diversity in animal and plant life. That's because in the early wave of SCP-3003-1 infections, the newly infected humans targeted any species that preyed on the Mars. These mass extinctions created famines and other ecological catastrophes, and led to a massive change in the way the humans of SCP-3003 live. The vast majority now live in carefully planned cities, built in the safe and temperate regions of the planet. These cities are mostly enclosed and are used for industry and food growth. They are also extremely tightly built, so much so that SCP personnel reported feeling claustrophobic. Many surfaces of the cities are coated with a material that closely resembles the feel of SCP-3003-1, the Mars Beetle. The infected are so fixated on the pleasure that being around these beetles gives them that they use this as a form of entertainment. The remaining members of this society live in rural areas, in small, carefully planned communities dedicated to farming, mining, or manufacturing. These small pods are even more structured than the cities. Children in this world are raised communally by large groups of workers specializing in health and education. They are infected quickly, at only a little over a year old, which is as soon as their supervisors are convinced they're physically capable. Once they are infected and their mindsets converted to the interests of the Mars, the children are quickly tested to determine their ideal occupation before being steered into what they will do for the rest of their life, where, like everything else on SCP-3003, their day-to-day -day life will be highly structured. Adults typically spend 10 hours a day at work, 
with the rest being spent engaging in basic activities like eating, sleeping, attending educational classes, and engaging in entertainment. But the entertainment all revolves around the society's obsession with SCP-3003-1. They listen to recordings of the beetle swarms, visit the enclosures where the beetles are bred, or obsessively touch the distinctive lumps that the parasite cause on their hosts. Everyone fits in on SCP-3003. There is no other option. Any sign of divergence from one's job function is cause for the authorities to step in. The first step is medical exams, to make sure that the parasitic infestation isn't becoming too harmful. Anyone who doesn't conform to the social standards is restrained by local members of the hive mind and brought in for observation. When someone becomes too old or sick to work for society and act as a host for the Mars, their usefulness is at an end and they are used for organ harvesting and experimentation. In the society of SCP-3003, one life has no meaning. Its only worth is the value it can bring to the hive mind. There's one area of SCP-3003's development that is of greater concern to the Foundation, though. Their technology. SCP-3003-3 works as one, and that has allowed it to develop technology far beyond that of what we have on Earth. Their planet is run almost entirely on wind, solar, and tidal power with a small amount also coming from geothermal and nuclear. Their computers have enough power to produce data that makes foolproof recommendations for public policy, and their artificial intelligence systems are far beyond anything the Foundation has developed. Their crops have been genetically modified to have ideal hardiness and nutritional value, and they routinely experiment on their own DNA for selective breeding purposes. The planet has launched satellites into space and visited the other planets in their solar system. But it's one invention in particular that has brought this strange planet to the Foundation's attention. SCP-3003-4 is a massive facility on SCP-3003 with one purpose to open wormholes that can transport members of the planet to any other point in space. Each use of this device uses up more energy than Earth uses in a full year, and the device seems to have been created with one goal in mind, to transport representatives to other planets that can expand their parasitic civilization to. The desire to spread the infection of the Mars is a single-minded obsession for the citizens of SCP-3003, and they now have their sights set on Earth. Unlike most dangerous specimens, SCP-3003 and its native species were not discovered in the wild. Rather, it made contact directly with the Earth through its wormhole generator, sending ambassadors who came bearing the news of their gospel of a better, unified way of life that would be achieved by joining their growing empire. They could have passed for missionaries. But what they were preaching was infection with a parasitic mutated beetle. The SCP Foundation was not prepared for this first contact, and collected all the evidence they could on this strange new society. They quickly came up with one conclusion. SCP-3003 was larger, more powerful, and more advanced than anything on Earth, even the SCP Foundation. With no other option available for containing the threat, the Foundation took the only approach they could, making peaceful contact with the Ambassadors and making them think Earth was interested in what they were offering. As long as the representatives of SCP-3003 think they are involved in peaceful negotiations for how to introduce the Mars to Earth, they are ready to cooperate and agree to some of the Foundation's terms. This has given the Foundation the opportunity to study the society and identify some potentially exploitable weak points, and they found one in particular that may give humans a chance for survival. That weakness? The representatives of SCP-3003-3 do not know how to lie. Once they're converted to host the Mars, everything they do serves a common purpose and is shared with every other member of their hive-like society. There is no need to lie and no purpose to it in their society. And as such, they can be deceived far more easily than most humans. That gives the SCP Foundation the chance to stall them and fool them into thinking Earth is planning for integration at its own pace. But even the residents of this strange civilization's patience may have its limits. The representatives seem cooperative at first, agreeing to many concessions the Foundation requested, including carefully regulating where they entered Earth, and making the Foundation their first point of contact for their Earth Contact and Research Committee. This allows the Foundation to ensure no invasive species makes their entry onto Earth unknown. Because the civilization is unable to lie, 
The Foundation has convinced them that Earth is contaminated and unable to host the Mars, with the species becoming sterile when introduced. The representatives seem to believe this and believe they are working on a solution with Earth. But some members of SCP-3003-3 may be becoming more aggressive. It was after a meeting with a representative of SCP-3003 that Foundation researcher Dr. Shaw entered an elevator with the alien. Suddenly, the Mars host became enraged, tearing the control panel out of the wall and stopping the elevator. Dr. Shaw was terrified, but the representative simply said it wanted some alone time. The SCP-3003-3 representative started speaking, but it didn't seem to speak like the other members. It was intense and intimidating, and most worrying, it referred to taking over a two-legged species over 500 years ago. It wasn't the human speaking, but neither was it the Mars. No, this was the single-cell organism that had puppeteered both them and the Mars. Unlike the humans of SCP-3003, it wasn't fooled by the Foundation's subterfuge. It knew they were resisting, and it didn't believe the story about the planet being inhospitable to the Mars. It wanted the Earth to surrender and join the hive mind, and it argued Earth would be better for it. No more war, no more conflict, no more hate, no more poverty. All it would take was the complete surrender of everyone on Earth's free will, and it made clear that it would win. It would be the last thing, the only thing left in the universe, and everyone would join it one way or another. It was clear that the threat of SCP-3003 was more pressing than thought, which posed a question. How do you contain an entire planet? The decision to classify SCP-3003 as Keter wasn't hard, but none of the Foundation's other tactics they'd use in the past would apply here. Investigation into the capabilities of the planet made clear that if a war was to break out between the two planets, it would end swiftly and decisively in favor of SCP-3003. If the SCP-3003-2 living inside the bloodstream of the planet's humans were aware of the Foundation's deceptions, they did not seem to be letting the humans of their planet in on this, so the deception would hold for now. But SCP-3003 was moving fast as well, and soon it might be too late to contain it. Two projects in particular concern the Foundation. One is a genetic tampering experiment to make SCP-3003-3 more hospitable to their purpose. It would add artificial genes to their human hosts, making them consume less resources, becoming immune to common pathogens, and making them able to host 10 times as many Mars inside their bodies. These genes would turn the infected humans into their own new species. They are working on traveling to and terraforming planets in other star systems, which would make them capable of spreading virtually anywhere, and at that point, impossible to contain. But the Foundation has some last-ditch plans in motion to stop this. In addition to continuing their disinformation campaign and the ongoing research into samples of the Mars and the single-celled being that mutates them, the Foundation is preparing for the worst-case scenario, too. They are spreading disinformation among scientists to ensure no additional contact is made with elements outside the SCP Foundation, and the O5 Council has authorized studies into how to eliminate this threat permanently. But the Foundation will only have one chance to do so, and any attempt will need to involve the elimination of their wormhole device to keep them from escaping because even one specimen escaping could mean infestation of another world, and eventually, the threat would begin anew. But for now, the Foundation has not deemed any plans for an attack to neutralize SCP-3003 either practical or likely to succeed, which means the Foundation is left focusing on maintaining stable relations with SCP-3003-3. They continue to try and convince them that the Earth is moving towards peaceful integration, and let's hope they succeed in this task for as long as they can, because for now, this is the only thing we have standing between us and the end of history. The year is 1941, and the world is gripped by the most violent and widespread war in history. Millions march to war as bloody battles are fought across the globe. Horrendous atrocities are carried out on groups of people, and parts of London are bombed to rubble on a weekly basis. Considering it's only been 20 years since the last World War, it must seem to the early residents of the early 20th century that the world is coming apart at the seams. And amongst the chaos, it'd be easy not to notice a secluded manor house in the English countryside disappearing without a trace for 11 days. 
before suddenly returning to our reality. But thankfully, one organization makes it its sole duty to notice the unnoticeable and understand the impossible, the SCP Foundation. And within that anomalous manor house, Foundation agents and researchers were about to find horrors beyond even their darkest imaginations. This is the grim tale of SCP-1461, better known as the House of the Worm. When the manor house reappeared after its 11-day absence, the Foundation zeroed in, sending agents inside to investigate. It was a two-level dwelling complete with 12 bedrooms, four baths, three studies, a main foyer-slash-ballroom, a library, a kitchen, and a pantry basement. The Foundation observed that a number of these rooms had been fitted with rows of bunk beds, similar to a boarding house or barracks. Only later would they understand why. They found that the upper portion of the home exhibited no abnormal qualities whatsoever. But as the agents investigated further, they found an entrance to the truly anomalous portion of the manor, the extensive sublevel system. No previous records of the building kept by the local council indicated that there would be anything below the manor's basement, so either the mysterious previous occupants, who were nowhere to be found, had built this sublevel, or it just appeared here on its own. Regardless of which was the case, agents and researchers knew that whatever had happened down here had everything to do with the manor's mysterious disappearance. They descended into the depths of what seemed like a man-made cave system, constructed primarily from a mix of concrete, iron, and brass. It was a behemoth of 20th century technology, intricate snaking systems of pipes, gears, and pumping pistons. It was like someone had built an entire factory down here. But for what? The agents began to spread out through the labyrinthian bowels of the manor, hoping to find some answers. But all they seemed to discover was more questions. This place hadn't been built with any form of comprehensible logic. It was full of dead ends. Stairways that ascended and descended to nowhere. Doors that would open to reveal just walls behind them or not open at all. It was like a maze built by a maniac. It didn't help that it looked like the place was recently hit by an earthquake, with some passages caved in and mangled machinery strewn about. It seemed that no human workers had interfered with the impossibly complex and bizarre machinery in quite some time. A number of the materials used to construct said machinery, as well as the grey sandstone filling in the collapsed passageways, remain unidentified to this day. Already, the sublevel was proving to be a complex puzzle box with only an estimated 75% of its layout ultimately being mapped by Foundation researchers. However, they would soon realize that this place wasn't just confusing, it was deadly. The only method of self-maintenance detected by the exploring agents were pipes that would fire a thick black lubricant onto the surrounding machinery. One of the Foundation agents had the misfortune of getting covered in it while exploring a darkened passageway and 80% of his body was melted as a result. It appeared that the viscous black goo was incredibly corrosive to all organic matter. A number of the machines also emitted dangerously high quantities of gamma and X-ray radiation, making it difficult to explore many of the caverns without heavy hazmat protection. And worst of all, were the extremely hostile creatures living in the caves who would regularly attack Foundation personnel. These abominations came to be known as SCP-1461-1, vicious steampunk Frankenstein monsters, once human, but with large parts of their bodies replaced by crude mechanical implants, including metal teeth and claws. 1461-1s have displayed a taste for human flesh, and they have dragged multiple Foundation agents down into their lair to be converted into monsters like them. It's believed that SCP-1461 is capable of controlling these bees through the strategic use of sound from its brass-speaking pipes, leading them into areas where Foundation personnel are present to instigate conflict. Many of these pitiful creatures have had their throats replaced by phonographs, endlessly repeating the same nonsense phrases over and over again. I am what you have made me. I am choice, and I am tyranny. Forgive me. I am then and I am now, what gods they will be then. I am evil and I am flesh, I am the trap. I am beauty and I am chaos, children are selfish. I am the worm, I have broken God. 
Still, in spite of the mazes, monsters, and deadly chemicals, the agents persisted and managed to discover several important locations. The gel production chamber on sublevel 3 creates glass jars from the unidentified sandstone and fills them with a slime that looks to contain living eyes and teeth. The factory deliveries room is filled with a huge number of crates and boxes, which seem to shift and change in number between Foundation patrols. The speaking tube room on sublevel 11 contains a grand pulpit that acts as the connecting point for the complex array of speaking tubes running through the entire cave system. The body parts of a deceased female also appear to be wired into the machinery, like spare parts. And on sublevel 12, they found the so-called catalyst room. Here, they discovered a huge, complicated, clockwork and steam-powered machine that appeared to be broken and missing some parts. Most horrifying of all, though, is the raised platform in the center of the catalyst room, on top of which is a metal hospital bed. A desiccated male corpse rests upon the bed, its chest punctured by large syringes connected by tubes to some kind of pumping machine. The parts connecting this pumping machine to the overall apparatus of the room were missing, though, leaving its purpose a mystery. The Foundation assumed that fluids used to be drawn out of this corpse to somehow power the machine. You may be starting to worry that there doesn't seem to be any answers here, that this house is one big mystery. But lucky for you, you're wrong. An old journal was also discovered in the Catalyst Room, and if what was written inside is to be believed, that we may finally have some truth about who created the House of the Worm, why it was created, and what horrible events triggered its mysterious disappearance and reappearance. His true name has been redacted by the Foundation, and special efforts have been made to maintain secrecy around the house, seeing as it's an anomaly of great interest to a cult known as the Church of the Broken God. So we'll just call the one who made this place the Inventor. Before any of this, the inventor was one of the many Englishmen traumatized and almost killed in the horrific trench battles of World War I. After a near-death experience, the inventor, like many geniuses and madmen, was plagued by surreal and nightmarish visions. He saw a huge creature that he referred to as the Worm, a gigantic metal monstrosity with dragon-like jaws full of gnashing gears that rampaged through Europe, destroying and devouring everything in its path. These apocalyptic visions also presented him with a solution, vague blueprints for a machine that might be the salvation of him and others willing to take his new gospel to heart, an escape from a world that the inventor knew in his heart was about to end. He hired work-starved laborers from across the country to help him make his visions a reality, and began a massive secret construction project beneath his isolated country manor house. For the inventor, it was all a labor of love. He wanted to protect his wife, son, and daughter from the terrible jaws of the worm. But as the project stretched on, his wife began to suspect that he'd lost his mind. Many of his workers, however, felt just the opposite. They became infatuated by the inventor's sermons on the nature of the worm and the coming apocalypse they hoped to escape. Soon enough, they had become a bona fide cult, constructing the elaborate sublevels underneath the house in preparation for the fast approaching day of reckoning. Then came World War II. The inventor saw Hitler, hungry for war, as one of the avatars of the worm. Finally, knowing that the time was right, he activated the machine and successfully trapped the worm in the bowels of his mechanized home. However, as the Blitz raged and London's bombing began, the inventor felt as though he hadn't stopped anything. He realized once and for all that he was never meant to stop the apocalypse, only escape it. And by throwing the final switch and setting the machine he and his followers had built into overdrive, he did just that. This was the moment that the House of the Worm disappeared, transporting the inventor, his family, and his devoted staff to a different world. An empty gray world, devoid of war but also lacking all the comforts of regular life, including food. Things went downhill from there, as their supplies quickly began to run out and the cult descended into cannibalism in order to survive. Things weren't going much better in the inventor's personal life. His wife, fearing what would happen to the family, took her own life and the life of his daughter. Though by this point, the inventor's mind was so fractured that it's possible he may have killed them himself. Either way, it was only the inventor and his son left, and more trouble was brewing. Eudora, one of the staff trapped in the building with the inventor and his cult, 
started a mutiny. She claimed the worm spoke to her from below, and that their only path to salvation was pleasing the worm. How would they please it? A sacrifice, of course. They would give it the son of the man who had trapped it. The mutineers took the inventor's only remaining child and descended into the lowest sub-levels. The inventor followed, hoping to track them down, save his son, and salvage something from this nightmare. As he ventured deeper, battling the members of Eudora's new cult, he found that they were changing themselves, becoming the half-human cyborg creatures that the Foundation would later discover. The inventor would find Eudora herself in the speaking tube room. Her body, still living, was wired into the machinery, and she had sacrificed his son to the worm. In a rage, the inventor murdered Eudora, or whatever was left of her, then heard a familiar voice speaking out of a nearby speaking tube. It said, I am what you have made me. I am then, and I am now. I am choice, and I am tyranny. I am evil, and I am flesh. I am beauty, and I am chaos. I am the worm. The voice was his own. In that terrible moment, the inventor realized that the worm wasn't a giant, all-devouring monster. It was him. In trying to protect his loved one from a perceived apocalypse, he'd brought them all to their horrible demise. He'd trapped them with the monster he'd hoped for them all to escape from, because no matter what you build, you can't escape from who you are. Grief-stricken and broken, the inventor descended into the catalyst room. There was his son, stuck with the syringes, drained of all life to fuel the mighty machine his father had created. In his last moments, the inventor decided to do the only noble thing. He threw himself into the machine, destroying both it and himself in the process. The house was transported back to our own reality, but the worm, in a sense, was no more. But who knows if the worm is really dead? Its thoughts and poisonous intent still lingers in the caverns and rattles through the speaking pipes. Whatever really happened, the Foundation is still picking up the pieces today, and who knows what lurks in the parts still hidden from our knowledge. We've all heard of the Led Zeppelin song, Stairway to Heaven, a title that invokes the image of a stairway leading up to a land of peace and paradise. But where else could a stairway lead? To a dusty attic full of old photo albums? To the upper level of a mall where the movie theater and frozen yogurt shop are neatly situated? Perhaps it leads to a rooftop with a beautiful view. Or maybe, just maybe, a staircase could lead you to SCP-2427. SCP-2427, appropriately nicknamed a thing full of stuff, is an extra-dimensional area filled with a variety of unusual and anomalous objects. SCP-2427 can be accessed by way of a broken stone staircase located in rural Ohio. According to local legend, carrying a sprig of hemlock up the broken stairs will allow a person to emerge into a mysterious grass clearing that appears to be in a forest somewhere in the United States. No matter what time a person ascends the staircase, the solar time in the clearing will always be 2 p.m. You know how people say it's 5 o'clock somewhere? Well, it's 2 o'clock somewhere too. And that somewhere is here. The pocket dimension that is SCP-2427 is thought to have been a holding area for weapons, prisoners, and artifacts belonging to an ancient cult known as the Brazen Heart. Little is known about this relatively obscure cult, other than the fact that they worship the demonic entity Moloch, a known enthusiast of violent human sacrifice, and were previously thought to have been eradicated during the Spanish Inquisition. The existence of SCP-2427 suggests that they are very much not eradicated, and are still active. They refer to these holding areas as attics, and though no confirmed members of the Brazen Heart have been contacted, it is considered possible that there are at least a handful of other attics hidden around the world. The Foundation has identified seven anomalous objects inside of SCP-2427 so far, each strange in its own beautiful, though often terrible, way. Like snowflakes, if they were capable of killing or maiming you. The first object in SCP-2427, aka SCP-2427-1, is a seemingly normal fire hydrant. However, if you think there's anything normal about the items found here, then you haven't been paying attention. The hydrant is made out of lead, and when opened, it expels high levels of ionized radiation. 
No specific measurements of the radiation have been taken yet, but it is definitely hazardous to human health. One unfortunate member of D-Class personnel has proven that it is a high enough level to melt human flesh. Sorry about your face, Dave. The hydrant is currently contained within an electrified perimeter and is not to be opened under any circumstances to prevent any further flesh melting. The last thing we need is another Dave incident. The second object contained within SCP-2427 or SCP-2427-2 is not actually an object at all. It's a building. Only on number two and we're already throwing curveballs at you. Trust no one. Surprises lurk around every corner. This particular building resembles a large multi-storied sanitarium built in the 1860s. Though it is clear from the outside that the building has or should have multiple stories, the inside is a different matter. Past the building's front doors is a non-Euclidean space consisting of a single floor and three sparsely decorated rooms with one central foyer. The first room is the holding place for SCP-2427-3. The second contains SCP-2427-4, and the third room contains nothing except scattered religious documents, bottled water, and a selection of canned food. No unauthorized staff are permitted to enter the building, in order to minimize complications or potential employee casualties. The first two anomalies on this list are hardly even strange by SCP Foundation standards. Sure, the hydrant can melt your face, and the building defies the laws of physics and space. But that's just a regular Tuesday around these parts. Huh, <sighs> been there, seen that. What else you got? Well, SCP-2427-3 is where things really get strange. If you're wandering through the bowels of SCP-2427-2 and you make a wrong turn into the first room, you will find yourself face to face with a startling sight. This entity is a combination of electronic circuitry, a cow's digestive tract, the hairless head of a human man, a hat rack, several lengths of garden hose, and an unidentified crystalline structure. This creature is extraordinarily fast and strong, exhibiting carnivorous tendencies and a very strong point of view on the world around it. Lucky for us, it is capable of speech and is able to tell us just what it thinks. Though this monstrosity doesn't have much of a right to pass judgment on anyone, cow intestine body and all, it has expressed a violent hatred of all life that it considers impure. Anyone who encounters SCP-2427-3 experiences an overwhelming desire to submit themselves for judgment, allowing the creature to determine their purity. There is a rumor that if one is judged to be pure, they will have a wish granted. If they are deemed impure, however, they will be devoured alive. If you're tempted to introduce yourself to the creature, your odds are not especially great. The creature has not encountered a single pure being yet. In order to protect the Foundation staff working in its vicinity, the entrance to SCP-2427-3's room has been sealed off with a reinforced steel door, and the windows have been paved over with concrete. Armed guards are watching the entrance at all times. The creature must be fed one live goat per day in order to keep its appetite satiated. The Foundation's goat budget is through the roof these days, but it's worth it to keep the thing contained. Better to spend money on goats now and not spend money on cannibalized personnel later. SCP-2427-4 consists not of an object located within a room, but the room itself. The room, which contains no furniture and a linoleum floor, has a peculiar effect on the human psyche. Once a person steps foot into the room, they lose consciousness for five minutes. During this time, they will speak freely, listing off a variety of negative qualities about themselves. Once they wake up, they have no memory of entering the state or anything that they said during it. It's cheaper than therapy, right? But it's also much weirder and less effective, so you get what you pay for in the end. A member of D-Class personnel who was observed inside of the room wax poetic about his personal failings, beginning his monologue with, My soul is a den of spiders, and ending it with, Oh, here, once I awaken, hesitate not to feed my flesh and my soul to the judge beast. Somebody give this guy a hug because the room seems to have no adverse effects on human test subjects except for causing everyone who hears their monologue a bit of discomfort. There are no containment procedures in effect for it at this time. We've had rooms, fire hydrants, and horrible meat-robot hybrids, and now you can't even trust the clouds in the sky. 
SCP-2427-5 is a seemingly innocent cloud, hovering stationary over the building. When looked at by a human for more than three seconds, the cloud will eject a ball of solid lead towards the person at a supersonic speed. That's right, folks. This cloud can and will shoot you. It hates being observed, but it also hates when you try to leave the perimeter. It will attack any person attempting to leave by firing the same lead ball at them. So far, 14 personnel have been killed by this highly aggressive cloud. And some people still think thunderstorms and hail are the worst things clouds have to offer. So naive. As it is a literal cloud, there is no way to contain it, so no people in the vicinity of the cloud are permitted to look at it for more than three seconds at a time. SCP-2427-6 is a series of 18 small trees, spread throughout the instance of SCP-2427. Above ground, the trees look normal, though their species has proven surprisingly difficult to determine. From an external perspective, they are simply ordinary trees. However, radar analysis revealed that the roots of these trees are deeply strange. Instead of the usual twisting tree roots, the ground below these trees contains a mass in the shape of a human body. Much to the disgust of the observing researchers, these humanoid masses occasionally twitch and move, as if alive. The trees themselves appear to be growing from the crotch area of each humanoid figure. How's that for Morningwood? I know, I get it, bad joke. This arrangement between tree and person seems to be some kind of punishment, as each tree is marked with a plaque reading, The Letras suffer what they must, and it is beautiful. Until it can be certain that the condition of these human roots is not contagious, these trees are to be treated as potential biohazards and isolated in individual containers. The final object in SCP-2427 currently categorized by the Foundation is SCP-2427-7. SCP-2427-7 is a pile of ashes and wood located just behind a posted sign that reads, The Liar's Cradle. Extensive testing has been established that the Liar's Cradle was almost certainly used as a torture device in interrogations performed by the Brazen Heart. A person standing within the boundaries of the cradle, which encompasses the aforementioned circle of wood and ashes, is unable to lie without suffering the consequences. Namely, they will be set on fire. The nature of how exactly the liar's cradle works is not certain, and more research needs to be done on it. However, this much is known for sure. It contains no sentient intelligence. It is not aware of what it is doing. It does not kill its victims, rather it keeps them miraculously alive as it sets them on fire, prolonging their agony and allowing their interrogators to get the truth out of them. A series of experiments reveal that it only immolates a person who is knowingly lying. D-Class personnel give demonstrably false information to repeat in the cradle without knowledge of its falsehood were not set on fire. However, when those same D-Class personnel knowingly lied in the boundaries, they immediately were set ablaze. It is almost certain that the Brazen Heart Cult used the cradle as a method of interrogating presumed liars in their midst. Further investigation will likely reveal human remains beneath the cradle itself, though this is just a hypothesis currently. But come on, there has to be some bones somewhere beneath something as ominous as the liar's cradle. Though they have only identified seven anomalies inside SCP-2427 at the moment, there are plenty more lurking in there, waiting to be discovered. In the foyer of SCP-2427-2, the Foundation discovered an extremely ominous list of items, clearly belonging to members of the Cult of the Brazen Heart. This list included some familiar items, such as Pilgrim Provisions, also known as the canned beans and soup found in SCP-2427-2, a level 3 purity proctor, a purge engine disguised as a fire hydrant, and the liar's cradle. However, it also contained many things that have not yet been discovered, such as one slaughtering perseverance, 27 pyre children, three ascended cultivars, seven supreme angelics, nine dragons, and the brazen heart itself. Dr. Gordon McElroy, site director of Area 2427, put out a memo to all level four and higher staff assigned to the area after the discovery of this list. Understandably, he was most concerned about the supreme angelics and the dragons, particularly the latter. 
The cult, as most cults are, is fond of deliberately obscure language, but you don't want to rule out the possibility they've got a fire-breathing lizard or two stashed away. In the meantime, as the Foundation is working to better understand the contents of SCP-2427, the area has been sealed off to the public. A 500-meter perimeter has been established around its entrance, and a fake private country club has been set up as a front. It's only a matter of time before the rest of the anomalies on the list are discovered, and this thing full of stuff gets even fuller of even more stuff. Let's just hope none of it ever gets out. Because if there are more of these addicts out there, who knows what else the brazen heart is hiding. Their little cult may not be as extinct as we thought. Somehow, most likely through some nefarious means, a fateful postcard has been sent to one of the residents of the murky, mysterious Araniram Island. Living on this particular island was already a strange and scary enough existence, given the horrors the inhabitants of Anariram share their home with. But perhaps the only thing just as horrible as life on that island was being sent a postcard. Sure, that doesn't sound all that horrible. Postcards are usually used to show a corner of the world far away and extend well wishes from friends or relatives on vacations. But ordinarily, postcards don't depict a photo of SCP-096 with the words, wish he was there, scrawled on the other side. From its containment cell at the SCP Foundation, the Shy Guy instantly sensed that somebody, somewhere, had seen a picture of its face. Breaking down into an enraged fit of homicidal insecurity, SCP-096 immediately broke from its containment chamber and made a cross-country beeline, heading straight for Araniram at anomalously accelerated speeds. Little did the creature or the Foundation know that the Shy Guy was being led straight into a trap, and the poor island resident who had received the chilling postcard, well, they were unlucky enough to be the bait. While the SCP Foundation started frantically trying to track down where it had gone, the Shy Guy had already made its way to a wooden cabin belonging to the unfortunate postcard recipient. Emerging from the now-emptied home once the owner was no more, SCP-096 would have returned to his cell just as quickly as he left. That is, if he wasn't the only monstrous creature on the island. A loud and sudden noise caught the creature's attention the sound of an old steam train whistle. It rang out once more, from somewhere off in the distance, but there was so much thick fog hanging in the air around Araniram that it was almost impossible to see anything, especially with how dark it was. The second time the whistle sounded, it was closer, but there was another sound too, and not the loud chugging of a steam engine that you would expect. It was an erratic, heavy thudding, the noise of lots of somethings drumming against the ground, causing the earth itself to shudder. Legs. They were the steps of multiple huge legs, crawling across the surface of the island, heading straight towards SCP-096. A third piercing whistle rang out, even closer still. This time, the orange glow of a light could be seen, dulled by the surrounding fog but getting brighter and clearer as it came closer. The light was casting shadows against the dark fog, long, spindly shapes of spidery appendages, until before the Shy Guy's eyes, a creature of pure nightmares came bursting out of the fog. It was a monstrous sight, even to SCP-096. Its body was the red front engine of an old-fashioned steam train, hoisted off the ground by four pairs of enormous, black, spindly, spider-like legs that propelled the beast forwards at a terrifying speed. Able to move without the limitations of needing to follow a railroad track, the monster was barreling towards SCP-096, with a twisted smile on its grotesque face. At the front of the locomotive was its circular face, with its unnaturally white eyes and a mouth that sported rows of razor-sharp teeth all covered in blood. This hellish abomination, a being that was part steam engine and part giant spider, was the terror of Araniram himself, the carnivorous Choo Choo Charles. Seeing Charles racing towards them on its eight spider legs would be enough to make anyone freeze up and stop in their tracks out of sheer terror. 
and SCP-096 was compelled to do the same. Except the terrifying train creature's pale eyes were looking directly at the shy guy. As Charles sized the anomaly up as its next meal, he was looking at it. And that meant SCP-096 had to kill him. The question was, how could it? How could the skinny, spindly humanoid hope to even fight something like Choo Choo Charles? He was much bigger, even more fearsome. But as quick as Charles could move on his spidery legs, he was not faster than SCP-096. In the blink of an eye, the shy guy raced off shrieking and sobbing in despair, leaving Charles to continue roaming his island territory in search of other human inhabitants to terrorize. SCP-096 had retreated to some nearby woods, quick enough to move out of Charles' path somewhere it could hide, for now. But the shy guy could feel a familiar, painful feeling almost pulling him back towards Choo Choo Charles, right back into harm's way. SCP-096 possessed an inescapable compulsion to kill anyone who looked at its face, and that seemed to include horrifying part-train, part-spider hybrids. It was a fact of the Shy Guy's very existence. He had to go after whoever looked at him and make them pay. In fact, it took all the creature's own strength not to instantly rush back over to Charles to try. SCP-096 knew that if it did, then there was little chance it would survive coming face to train face with the terror of Araniram. However, while it was watching Choo Choo Charles from a safe distance, seeing him crawl across the landscape on his multiple legs, that SCP-096 noticed something. It was another light obscured by the fog, but this one was much higher up. One could almost mistake it for the moon if it wasn't getting closer all the while accompanied by the sound of whirring rotors. While the Shy Guy had been evading Choo Choo Charles, the SCP Foundation had been tirelessly trying to track down its location, and now they'd found their runaway anomaly here on Araniram Island. As the chopper carrying the mobile task force drew nearer, the tyrannical train turned and took notice. To SCP-096, the Foundation's arrival could have meant a way home and away from the spidery steam engine, but to Charles, the approaching chopper meant only one thing, a new source of food. Captain! One of the MTF troops aboard the chopper called over his headset. What is it? Do we have eyes on SCP-096? The captain replied before realizing what he'd said. Well, not eyes on, because then it would have jumped up onto the chopper and killed us all. I mean, is there any sign of SCP-096 on the island? Negative, sir, although you should probably see this! The soldier replied. Begrudgingly, the captain unbuckled himself from his seat and snatched the Foundation operative's binoculars, using them to look down at Araniram below. It didn't take him long to spot the massive, multi-legged monstrosity that was Choo Choo Charles, who had fallen still, waiting for the chopper to descend low enough for him to reach. Good gravy, what on earth is that thing? The captain exclaimed, before taking another look through the binoculars. Is that... Wait, what is an instance of SCP-2086 doing out here? SCP-2086 was an infamous anomalous species the Foundation had encountered before. Much like Charles, they were anthropod-like creatures with multiple long legs that protruded from a body resembling a man-made mode of transport. However, SCP-2086s usually took on the appearance of buses while in vehicle form. Sir, I, I don't think that's an SCP-2086, the lookout replied. To me, it looks more like an instance of SCP-3023. Impossible all the way out here, the captain retorted. We're nowhere near the region where the anomaly occurs. It could have scurried its way from Germany and taken nest here, sir, the trooper responded. Yet another anomaly that Choo Choo Charles bore a striking resemblance to. SCP-3023 was a rare phenomenon that was known to occur at random, but was limited to a specific area of central Germany. The effect of this phenomenon caused ordinary, everyday, inanimate objects of any shape or size to suddenly turn into aggressive spiders, sporting eight legs that grew from whatever was affected by SCP-3023. Perhaps Choo Choo Charles was indeed an instance of SCP-3023, or some distant evolutionary offshoot of SCP-2086, who was hard to say for sure. The only thing for sure was that Charles was a man-eating beast, more so than an insidious villain. And being so highly territorial, he considered the entire island of Araniram to be his natural habitat and his hunting ground. Anything that arrived in his vicinity was prey to the terrifying train, 
and his ravenous craving for human flesh meant he was ready to attack the descending SCP Foundation chopper. All right, let's go, go, go! The MTF captain called to his troops, signaling them to start rappelling out of the helicopter and down to the island. Keep your scramble goggles on, Max. We still need to recapture 096. But first priority is taking down this big, ugly beast. Wearing goggles specifically designed to distort the Shy Guy from their view, the team began abseiling out of the aircraft. But Choo Choo Charles was already waiting for them. Rearing back on its four back legs, the nightmarish train spider swiped at the descending MTF operatives. What first seemed like an instinctive, uncoordinated assault quickly became precise and relentless strikes as Charles sliced through some of the cables the MTF troops were using to repel down. Their lifeline cut, the unlucky Foundation operatives plummeted from mid-air, right down towards where the terror of Aaron Neerum was waiting for them to fall. A few of the MTFs made it to the ground alive, and immediately began retaliating against Choo Choo Charles. The gunfire from their weapons flickered all around the carnivorous creature, but their bullets could barely chip the red paintwork on his steam train body. Dashing towards his helpless human prey on his many legs, Charles began to feast. Then suddenly, something started pulling at one of his huge spider legs, pulling Charles back moments before he had a chance to claim his latest victim, the captain of the Foundation's MTF. It was SCP-096, having zipped out of hiding and shrieking wildly as it used all of its strength to wrench one of Choo Choo Charles's multiple limbs. Angered that it couldn't reach the MTF captain, the part spider, part train hybrid stomped the leg that was being pulled in a successful attempt to free itself from the Shy Guy's grip. But in the same instant, SCP-096 used its anomalous speed to reappear in front of the already angered locomotive monster. With his railroad rage about to reach its breaking point, Charles entered into a relentless rampage, making quick work of the leftover MTF troops before setting his sights squarely on SCP-096. But doing that was his biggest mistake. Now Choo Choo Charles had seen the Shy Guy twice, and to the insecure anomaly, that meant Charles had to go. Traveling faster than even the multi-legged monstrosity could perceive, SCP-096 began racing towards Choo Choo Charles's many legs. The Shy Guy had realized that it didn't stand a chance of dealing with the terror of Aaron Neerum the same way it handled all the others that had seen its face. So instead, it had settled on a new approach, specifically tailored to taking down the spider-legged steam engine. One by one, SCP-096 started knocking Charles's many legs out from underneath him, effectively tripping him up over and over again. The Shy Guy moved so quick that the cumbersome Charles could barely react in time, having one leg after the other knocked out from beneath him, causing him to tumble to the ground. Normally, Choo Choo Charles was smart enough to retreat if he encountered something that could fight back. If he was injured badly enough, the spider-like creature would scuttle out of harm's way in order to heal his wounds. But the rage at being constantly tripped up by SCP-096 was distracting Charles from the Shy Guy's true ploy. With every leg it knocked out from underneath the spidery steam train, SCP-096 had been gradually directing Charles towards a nearby gorge. With a terrifying burst of anomalous speed, the Shy Guy caused Choo Choo Charles to topple over sideways, rolling over himself until he landed upside down in the bottom of the rocky gorge. The multi-legged locomotive monster's spindly legs flailed desperately as he tried to reposition himself, but with no luck. SCP-096 had managed what first seemed to be impossible and beaten the terror of Aaron Neerum, Choo Choo Charles. Or for now, at least. One fine morning, your distant Aunt Carol came to your family home in an almost frantic state of excitement. Carol had always been a bit eccentric, totally harmless of course, but what you'd describe as being on the more zealous side of religious. Predictably, she wanted to ask you and your family to come to church with her. Seeing as you don't see Aunt Carol often, you and your family decide that there's no harm in indulging her. You're not an atheist family by any means. In fact, you were all raised Catholic, but it felt like it'd been forever since you last went to church. Aunt Carol wanted to show you and your family the special celebrations that went on at her church. You remember her practically grabbing you by the wrist and dragging you to the building, her eyes filled with a crazed enthusiasm. That's when you saw something incredibly strange. There were shadows moving behind the elaborate stained glass windows, thousands of tiny shadows darting around, and this low humming noise you faintly recognized. 
What was that noise? It was the cry of cicadas, but this was only early spring. What were cicadas doing awake at this time of year? You didn't get much time to ponder this question. In the next few seconds, you and the entire church were surrounded by heavy-duty tactical vehicles. What appeared to be a large and heavily armed SWAT team poured out of the vehicles. Unbeknownst to you, these were a mobile task force sent in by the SCP Foundation, specifically MTF Y99, also known as the Altar Boys, a specially trained group of Foundation agents used for anomalies of a religious nature. You, your aunt, and the rest of your family are rounded up to be debriefed and given amnestics. One of the last memories they took from you was the sight of Foundation agents dragging bloody bodies out of the church. As the doors opened, thousands of cicadas streamed out and disappeared into the skies. But these weren't like any kind of cicada you'd ever seen. They were beautiful. Their rainbow-colored wings reminded you of ornate stained glass. Who could have guessed that these pretty little bugs are tied to an entity very likely to bring about an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario someday in the future? The bugs, the bodies in the church, and even your aunt's incredibly strange behavior all fall underneath the umbrella of a Keter-class anomaly known as SCP-3004. But to truly understand this anomaly that was once thought to be destroyed and the implications of it still living today, we need to go back 600 years to Ireland in the 15th century. This era was believed to be the origin of a Gaelic religious movement known as Caitlagi, or the Singers in English, a splinter sect of Druidism. But this was no fringe cult. The Singers were a mainstream religion in the British Isles for several hundred years. Its members included people of all social classes, from lowly peasants to powerful and respected figures. They mingled heavily with Christians, mostly Irish Catholics, and at some point in history came close to overtaking Christianity as the dominant religion in Ireland. So, who were these people, if they're supposedly such a large part of recent history in the area? Like most Druids, their relationship with nature was a key part of their belief system. In particular, they prized an extinct species of cicada known as Cicadetta luculenta, or the stained glass cicada in English. The life cycle of birth and resurrection that the cicadas underwent fascinated the singers, and they performed a number of holy rituals around it. One recorded ritual was the celebration of children entering adulthood that was marked by them first losing their baby teeth. But the rituals of the singers accidentally opened some kind of door to a being from a different plane of reality, dubbed SCP-3004-1 by the Foundation. This being is an immensely powerful thought form that the Foundation believes to be a pittisphage, or faith eater. It appears to have been attracted to our universe by the rituals of the singers, and so took a form relevant to their beliefs, namely a huge cicada, in order to feed on their faith. If things had stopped there, then this would be an almost innocent symbiotic relationship, but the interactions between SCP-3004-1 and our world led to dangerous consequences due to its powerful reality-warping abilities. For example, during some rituals, huge numbers of stained-glass cicadas would burst from the mouths of those participating, often causing them to choke to death. Other times, 3004-1 would manifest physically in the sky above its new worshippers, causing painful boils on whoever witnessed it, and occasionally symptoms akin to radiation sickness. It appeared that 3004-1 was growing more powerful over time, and its rise to power was intrinsically linked to the rituals of the singers and the existence of the stained glass cicadas. Two groups that predated the Foundation, the Vatican's Congregation for Otherworldly Acts, and the English government's Royal Society for the Imprisonment of Abnormality essentially performed an all-out religious genocide on the singers. No meaningful trace of the religion was left when they were done, aside from their own records. While they were at it, they also exterminated all the stained glass cicadas, leading to a complete stop of all SCP-3004 activity. It seemed like despite the great human and ecological cost, the anomaly had been neutralized. A few centuries later, though, a series of strange cicada-related anomalous events started to occur across the United States. A strange man, seemingly made almost entirely from cicada chitin, would appear at christenings, weddings, and funerals. Each time his presence would cause the people in attendance to do and experience horrific things, 
and lead to legacies of hardship and death that would linger for decades. This became known as SCP-2852, or Cousin Johnny, and it should have been the first clue that the nightmare of SCP-3004 was resurfacing, but since 3004 was already archived as neutralized, nobody made the connection. Sometime later, SCP-2852 incidents ceased, and around that exact time, SCP-3004 instances started anew. It manifested in the form of strange, anomalous activities taking place at Christian church services, specifically those from Roman Catholic, Eastern Catholic, Anglican, and Episcopalian communities. The only clues to outsiders would be an increase in reported church attendance and an increase in deaths from natural causes within the community. These two stats were how the Foundation first noticed something was amiss. Just as it had done with the singers centuries before, SCP-3004-1 had latched onto the beliefs and rituals of Christians and was using this new connection to harvest more faith for sustenance. The results were twofold. First, religious fervor and excitement to attend church services saw a huge increase. Secondly, the actual content of these services took a hard turn for the horrific. Much like Cousin Johnny infiltrations, this really isn't for the faint of heart by any definition. For example, young people with Christ-like stigmata wounds being bitten to death by priests, children removing the teeth of priests before they all start vomiting huge numbers of stained glass cicadas. There were extremely unpleasant rituals involving castration, and even a pregnant woman giving birth to even more swarms of stained glass cicadas. We could go on, but you probably get the idea. Rituals inspired by SCP-3004-1 are horrific, and all seem to involve the same extinct breed of stained glass cicadas worshipped by the singers before their annihilation. But how can these insects, which have been dubbed SCP-3004-2, be here in the present if the Foundation forerunners made them extinct so many centuries ago? The answer is simple, but strange. While they have all the hallmarks of being alive, the stained glass cicadas present during modern iterations of SCP-3004 events aren't actually real. Genetic tests have shown that they're actually made from a mix of wood and real stained glass. These insects fly away from the scene after the rituals are completed, traveling around 600 miles from the site before disappearing completely. The Foundation was growing concerned about the nature of SCP-3004, especially given that instances were becoming more frequent and harder to contain. Foundation scientists determined that the creature known as 3004-1 likely existed within a layer of reality just above our own, and if it ever managed to breach our reality, the world level of violence and chaos it could cause would likely lead to an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. Drastic actions would once again be needed to prevent this, so they devised an emergency containment procedure that would only be used as a last resort. The procedure, known as Protocol Damantio ad Bestias, would use a mixture of mass amnestic treatment and thaumial objects to completely erase Christianity from not only the modern world, but all of history, in hopes of cutting off SCP-3004-1's food supply to kill the entity, or at least prevent it from entering our world. The plan would center on placing a powerful Roman Catholic reality warper, who volunteered for the job of course, into an anomalous group of machines known as the Lions, by submitting the Reality Warper to a lifetime of suffering and essentially erasing him from existence, so too will it erase the world's full knowledge of Christianity and hopefully save the world. This man will become the last martyr, dying for all of humanity. He will become the last saint, St. Jude the Damned, Bulwark Against Darkness. You might ask, are you sure that's necessary? There's so much we don't know about 3004-1. Do we know for a fact that it's dangerous? Enter Agent Timothy Lutterman, a member of Mobile Task Force Sigma-25, also known as Ghostbusters. Lutterman was part of a foundation project known as Site C Lux, using an astral projection technology that would free his consciousness from his body and allow it to travel freely between metaphysical planes. In plain English, they could use Lutterman's floating mind as a kind of spy and insert it into 3004-1's dimension. They achieved this by capturing one of 3004-1's false stained glass cicadas and releasing it again, allowing Lutterman's mind to follow it home to its master. However, what we thought would be a simple intel gathering mission turned into a complete nightmare. Lutterman found that 3004-1's dimension was entirely void, 
Aside from the entity itself and the millions of buzzing stained glass cicadas, the entity was so huge and so complex that it physically hurt to look at. Letterman observed that its form kept shifting, from a giant cicada, to an old man, to a cicada nailed to a wooden cross, to an infinite mess of wood and stained glass. But even more terrifying than its physical appearance were the contents of its mind. 3004-1 forced itself into Agent Letterman's brain, and in that moment, he finally understood it. The entity, which had no concept of metaphors, allegory, or the divide between fact and fiction, truly believed that it was the Abrahamic God depicted in the Bible, and that all Christians are lovingly worshipping it. In its rituals, it was imposing some of the bloodiest parts of the Bible onto its flock, believing that's what they wanted. All the while, it fed on their faith, growing bigger and more powerful. Letterman found that just being there with the creature was hurting his soul. If it wasn't a god yet, he believed it had the power to become one in time, and he advised the Foundation shouldn't send anyone else to its dimension. It was too great a risk to all life on Earth. Perhaps to prevent the horrible fate of all of us being destroyed by 3004-1, erasing Christianity would be a worthy sacrifice. That is, if it actually works. After all, they thought destroying the Singers would neutralize 3004 once and for all. And yet, here it is again. For all we know, we may just be prolonging the inevitable. Now go check out SCP-001 The Children Ouroboros Cycle and SCP-5000-Y The Full Compilation for more freaky anomalies with world-shattering implications.